Okay. Just quickly in the chat, can you see these? Can you see this slide? Yeah, you can. Okay, perfect. Awesome. Uh, let's jump in. So we're talking about employee one-on-ones, and here's my big promise to you, that when you walk out of here, you're going to have a simple framework that is guaranteed to increase the performance and the satisfaction of your staff, all right? A simple framework. We're going to walk through it, and uh, we're going to try to keep things as simple as we can today. Also, there's a resource guide. I will email you after this is over, and uh, there's a bunch of different things in here. I'll walk through some of them as we're going, but I just want you to know that you're going to be having that, all right? So let's talk a little bit about why we would uh, have one-on-ones, and what I'll ask you guys in a this? moment just to, yeah, how many of you are, are having one-on-ones right now, but uh, one-on-ones are a fantastic tool. I don't even want to call it a tool, but they're a fantastic thing to do. It's one of the ways we build trust with our staff. We're going to help them grow. Uh, we're going to help employees uh, feel, you know, passionate and purposeful about their work. Uh, we're going to give them uh, specific Hello. things to help them make adjustments, specific feedback. Uh, we're also going to be setting the time aside, which communicates that they are a priority and all wow, of them are going to help us with uh, communication. So let me just, I have to, I have to share in this mode Where's because that? I can't hear my cursor. And I'm going to mute a couple of you because just because I hear your your mics. All right. Perfect. 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 So <clears throat> let me ask you guys this, uh, just so we we keep you guys engaged here. Um, when you think about one on ones, what what gets in the way of one on ones, especially what gets in the way of powerful one on ones? Like for you, maybe you do them, but then things get in the way or maybe you don't do them. And there's a reason. And I'd love to know why that is. Megan says time, Courtney says time, Bill schedules time, lack of prep time, lack of time. Yeah, that's going to be, that's going to be, you know, survey says answer number one, right? Because this is probably a little bit about what your life feels like. <clears throat> I work with uh, lots of companies and uh, I do a lot of coaching with uh, executives and, and the C-suite and it doesn't matter top to bottom. Everyone is, is one of the things that, one of the challenges people live without margins, Right. And especially managers and uh, that kind of thing. And so it doesn't give us time. So we're going to be talking about that. And I'm not here to add more hours to your plate. But I'm here to help you actually get some back. So but first, before we get into that, just a confession. I'm not sure how you got into leadership. I'm not sure how I got in. Honestly, I this is me as a kid. I grew up. <laughs> excuse me. I grew up redheaded. Freckle faced shy kid on a farm. And uh, I was just content to uh, hang out with my dog and know people. And <clears throat> but you know, life uh, life gives you different opportunities. I would not have ever thought I would go into a position of leadership, and I did actually. When I got out of college, I was going to become a film director, and uh, I took a, a turn, unexpected turn, and I actually went into ministry for a while. And I was in ministry, and I would, became a preacher for a while. And then after I was doing that, I started teaching leadership in the not-for-profit world. And then that moved on to uh, moved on to the corporate world. And so, you know, decades later now, uh, I wrote a book called Nine Minutes on Monday. Some of you might may have heard of that or read that. All you guys that assured, you know, who I've worked with, I've had a chance to share the stage with some great guys like John Maxwell and uh, really speak all over the world, a lot of HR uh, conferences. So I, I know the journey, and I'm going to just tell you from the front uh, something you already know, leadership it isn't easy, right? Leading people isn't easy. At the same time, it doesn't have to be complicated. And so we want to uncomplicate it a little bit. Lynn, Glinda loves nine minutes. Awesome. Thank you. So <clears throat> I need you to make me a promise, though. I need you to step into a growth mindset today. There's going to be things I say that uh, you already know, of course. Uh, there's going to be things I say that maybe you just think I, that's not practical. That won't work for me. Just going to say, hey, keep an open mind and let's just all step in as learners and you never know what might happen. Also, as we go through this, be thinking about one employee as you go through this training. Because I'm going to be talking about one-on-one. -on -one. So I want you to think about one employee one and employee. just write their first name in the chat for me. Who would that be? If you were going to write one name, what would be one name of an employee that you're going to think through today? 
We got John Kelly. Yeah, because this will be important. John Kelly, Lexi, Liz, Missy, Diana, Mark. Awesome. You guys got it. You got the hang of it. So before we jump in the actual one-on-one, -on -one, let's let's just review for a moment. At the end of the day, right, you and I are paid to produce a result. Everyone here. You're paid to produce a result, but the thing is, who produces that result? Yeah, it's partly you, but it's also mostly it's from the people that you lead. That is who is going to produce the result. And so if your people are responsible really for your success, then you want to make sure they're you are doing everything possible to help them be as successful as you need them to be. So keep that in mind. Our number one priority is to help our staff be as, as successful as we need them to be. And this is where one-on-ones come in because one-on-ones, this is your competitive advantage. I'm telling you, there's nothing like one-on-ones when you do them right consistently over time to maximize someone's performance. All right. So that's what we're going to jump into today. But before we do that, I want you to, uh, some of you have seen this before because you've you've seen my work before, but motivation exists on a scale, right? So, you know, some people will come and tell you like, hey, you can't motivate people. Like they can only motivate themselves. And people who say that, they just don't understand motivation. Motivation exists on a scale. On the far left, right, where this red dot is, we have external motivation, highly controlled motivation. This is the bear is chasing you and you are going to run, right? So the bear is the motivator. You have to, it's highly controlled. This is a gun to your head. This is a boss saying, uh, hey, you've already had two write-ups and one more and you're gonna be fired if you don't get this done. Highly controlled motivation, does it work? Of course it does. But what's the problem with this type of motivation? Can you type that in the chat for me? What's the problem with this kind of motivation? Gun to your head, bear's chasing me, boss is threatening me, fear-based, Drives fear. Juanita says fear-based. Uh-huh. Based on the wrong thing, says Bill. It is fear-based. And it's short-lived, as uh, a couple of you said. Not sustainable. Yeah, because when the bear stops chasing me, I'm going to stop bringing it, right? And so, but a lot of managers actually lead from here. They don't even realize it. But what happens when we move up this scale? We get to this place, this threshold of autonomy. This is an important place where people go from having to do something so they want to do something. And now a completely different uh, set of, of drivers take over because at least they want to do it. The motivation is still from the outside, meaning they're doing it for reward, doing it for a good assignment, doing it for praise from the boss, whatever it might be, doing it for a bonus. Where we really see amazing performance, though, is when we can get someone over here. This is where somebody, this is, where somebody is motivated from the inside. Yeah. The intrinsic motivation, right? There is. And when somebody's intrinsically motivated, now suddenly they have more. Uh, oh, somebody needs to mute. If you guys can make sure you're all on mute, we really hear some of you. Somebody's intrinsically motivated. They bring it. I mean, they bring more of their heart. They invest their time, their energy. They want to do a great job. Now, here's a here's a. Here's a good analogy to help you understand this. For those of you who have heard me say this, you know, uh, bear with me. But imagine that on any given Saturday, there's three guys. They all live next door to each other, and each one of them has to mow their lawn. Neighbor number one, the guy over here on the left, he doesn't want to mow his lawn, but he gets this threatening letter from the HOA telling him, like, hey, if you don't mow your lawn, by Sunday we're going to fine you. All right, that, that secret society known as the HOA, who no, who no one knows who's on it. So... What does he do? He gets out angrily and he mows his lawn. Well, neighbor number two, the guy in the middle, he doesn't want to mow his lawn. He's watching college football. But his wife comes to him and says, hey, my mom's coming to town tomorrow. I'd love the place to look nice. If you mow the lawn, I'll make you your favorite chocolate cake. So we have incentivized the task with a bonus. And he, at least he wants to mow the lawn. Not so much the lawn, but he wants the chocolate cake, right? So he's motivated. He wants to. The guy on the right, this is, the, this is neighbor number three. He loves mowing his lawn. He loves the exercise, loves the smell of fresh cut grass, and he especially loves to stand on the street after, look at his place, knows it looks good, and has a sense of pride of ownership, and also knows he's doing a good job being a good neighbor because he suspects that his wife is actually on the HOA, but he's not sure. Now, let me ask you this question. Who does the best job mowing their lawn? Neighbor one, neighbor two, or neighbor three? 
Who does the best job mowing their lawn? One, two, or three. Yeah, you guys got it for sure. Who blows grass all over the sidewalk and doesn't sweep it up? Neighbor one, neighbor two, or neighbor three. Yeah, exactly. But here's what I want you to see. In all three cases, the job got done. It wasn't that it didn't get done. The job got done. And this is one thing that we have to understand as leaders. It's not just about getting our people to do the job. We want them to do their job excellently. And in order to do that, they have to be, they have to have a source motivation that comes from within. They need that internal intrinsic motivation. And as leaders, we can help shift that source of their motivation. And ha and part of the way we're going to do that is in our one-on-ones. So that's why I want you to see why this is so important about what we're about to talk about today. Because the principles I'm going to share with you, they're going to help you shift people from neighbor one to neighbor two to neighbor three. Okay. All right. I need everyone to do a mic check. I want you to make sure that you guys are all muted because I have some of you that are not muted because I hear you. I'm going to look for you and look for your mic so I can mute you. There we go. That's one. Um, bear with me a moment. Mm, mute, mute you, mute you, mute you. There's probably a, a mute all button that I just don't know about. Uh, okay, I think we got it. Perfect. Alrighty. Let's get back to uh, let's get back to this. Okay, perfect. Thanks, guys. For your patience there. A one-on-one -on -one is not a regular business meeting. It's just not a regular business meeting, but it is a meeting, and it is a meeting you have to lead, and it is a meeting you have to control. Have any of you ever had a meeting? Maybe you're not leading it. You're in a meeting, and it just goes off the rails. Like you're in a meeting and then it just gets bogged down and we get nothing done. Of course, everyone's been in those meetings. One-on-one -on -one can become like that, but you don't want it to because it has a specific purpose and we want to make sure we stick to it. A good analogy for a one-on-one -on -one is like this. Any of you guys have this? Um, any of you, meaning any of you, like when I was a kid, we had these little Hot Wheels and uh, somebody bought us this little charger station. It didn't look this nice. It was much more primit primitive. Right, but you had the track and the track went through this little thing and it was just wheels spinning. And when your car went in there, the wheels just shot it out. And that and it just picked up speed until you know went around the track and was slowing, 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 and it went in there and bam. That's what a one-on-one -on -one should be like. A one-on-one -on -one should be like a booster station on a Hot Wheels track. Your employee should come out of that revved, excited, empowered, more clear about what they're doing. Uh, than they were before they went in. And so there should be a motivational property to it. And here's the thing, we don't want to overcomplicate it. So in order to do that, there's really four, it's just four things we want to accomplish in a one-on-one. -on -one. And in a sense, they're desires. And here they are. I want to make sure you're doing well. I want to make sure you're making progress and succeeding. I want to make sure you're growing. And I want to make sure you're in the loop. That's it. Now, some of those sections might take longer than others on certain days, but I that's it. You know, like if I'm uh, Ryan, if, if, you, uh, if you and I are in a one-on-one, -on -one, I, I want to make sure you're doing well. I want to make sure you're making progress and, and experiencing success. I want to make sure you're growing, and I want to make sure you're in the loop, right? That's what I want. And that's probably what you want as well. And so you can think of this almost like different conversations. And... <clears throat> I'm going to tell you one conversation not to have in the one-on-one. -on -one. And that's the, that's the difficult conversation. We don't want to save a difficult conversation for uh, the one-on-one. -on -one. And why, why do you think that is? Why do we not want to have difficult conversations in the one-on-one? -on -one? Like not that they might spring up from time to time, but why do we not want to have that? Yeah, Bill says it should be motivating, should be positive. We want to protect the space, right? We want to protect the speed. The the you're right, jo Joanne. Doesn't mean the four desires. We want to protect the space. We want to protect the process. 
And we do that by keeping that out as best we can. Okay, maybe we have to, or maybe a difficult conversation sprouts up while we're in our one-to-one, -one, but we want these to really be positive. This does not mean that you wouldn't challenge your staff in a one-on-one. -on -one. This doesn't mean that you wouldn't call them higher. This doesn't mean that you wouldn't have concerns about performance issues. But if you know there's going to be a difficult conversation, then we try to keep that as best we can out of that space because, yeah, we want to protect it. Have you ever had a have you ever had a leader or a boss in your life who only wanted you in their office when there was a problem? I'll often ask people, hey, what would you think if your boss said, hey, can you come to my office? The first thing everyone says, I'm in trouble. Right? Well, why is that? Because the only time you get invited to the boss's office is you are in trouble. And so you you pair it with that. It's it, it, there it is. So here's the framework of what we're going to be walking through. Really four, I made everything start with a C, right? Just so we could make it easier to remember. But uh, we start in the top left, connection and concern. Uh, that's our first thing we're going to do in our one-on-one. -on -one. Then we're going to go down to the blue, calibration. This is where we talk about performance. We talk about how they're doing, and we're there to help them. Uh, top right, coaching, growth and development, and lastly, communication. So I'll walk through these, obviously, in detail as we're going. Uh, the clarity and connection is where we're going to go first. Uh, when we get to the calibration section, we're going to be talking about performance, progress, obstacles. How do we make sure that we are bringing the things into someone's job that's going to help motivate them, right? And how do we make sure that they're experiencing success and that we are igniting that psychological principle called striving, right? So I'm going to show you how to do that. Then when we get to this section on learning and development, on which is about coaching, I'm going to give you some, some simple ideas of how you can uh, coach your staff. I'll even show you behind the scenes of, of some of the ways I coach either my staff and people outside my company as an executive. So I'll show you some of the things I do there. And we'll round out with this section, which is pretty quick, honestly. This will take us five minutes at the end. But that's where we're going to go. But let's go ahead and first start here, all right? We're going to go fairly quick today. If you have questions, throw them in the chat, but also put your hand up so I'll, I'll know to look for it. And we will, since this is two and a half hours, we will take a break, probably around 90 minutes. We'll take a short break and then uh, we'll all come back. All right. Let's start here, though. <clears throat> Number one, the first desire. I want to make sure you're doing well. I want to make sure you're doing well. Why would this even be part of the equation? Like, why would we concern ourselves with this when, after all, we're a business, we got to be professional, we're here to work, and so what does any of this have to do with making sure someone's okay? Why would I want to know? I'm not their parent. He has lots of great comments. Devin says you care about the entire person. If someone isn't doing well, it impacts their work. Yeah, their problem becomes my problem. Not that that's my first priority, like from a selfish perspective, but their problem becomes my problem for sure. If someone isn't doing well, it impacts their work life, says Abby. Jacqueline says when people are well, business is often well. Exactly. Yeah, they matter. It sends a message for sure. Um Towers, I often cite this uh, survey, Towers Perrin, now Towers Watson, they surveyed 90,000 people from around the globe, asking them, what drives engagement for you? And you know what the number one answer was? 92% of this, people said this, they said, when senior management takes a genuine interest in me as a person, a genuine interest. For a visual on the numbers on this, this is Michigan. This is Michigan's uh, stadium, which holds around 100,000. I blocked out the people who don't have, I want to be cared about as the number one driver of engagement. All the rest of those people, they're like, the number one thing that drives engagement for me is when I know management takes a genuine interest in me as a person. Well, why is that? A couple of reasons, right? One is that when staff feel cared about, they tend to trust us more, right? If someone cares about me, I'm less likely to think they're going to stab me in the back and it creates some psychological safety. So I'm going to, I'm going to be able to show up and give more. The other principle though, is this thing called reciprocity. 
Reciprocity is that psychological phenomenon that when somebody does something nice for you, you suddenly feel indebted. Someone buys your lunch, you feel like, okay, I, I, next one's on me. Right, it's just how we protect our relationships. We just go back and forth like that. Reciprocity. So when someone, when a boss cares about you, you want to care back. You, you can't help but to care back. And how do you care back? You don't want to let them down. You want to show up and do a good job. You want to make sure you're doing, not causing them stress. And so there's a lot of principles that happen when someone feels like they are cared about. And this is what helps move our leadership from transactional to relational. What well, you think of it in this way, everything we do is not everything, but this whole work thing that we all have to do, it's just, a, it's a very transactional thing. I'm going to show up and I'm going to give you hours and you're going to give me money and you might give me uh, some benefits and I'm going to give you time and my best effort. It's transaction. The problem with transactions is they break down quickly. And when things aren't, when people feel like the transaction is breaking down, like, hey, this isn't fair anymore. Hey, I don't really like this. Like when the equation starts to not work, that's when people start either quitting or silently quitting. As how do we protect the equation? We bring in the relational aspect of it. Now, I'm not talking about friendship. Those are two different words. You don't have to be friends with your direct reports. You don't have to be. Um, but you need a good relationship with them. And so that's what it is. And the fact that you have a one-on-one -on -one already communicates something. Because everyone knows you're busy. Because they're busy too. And we we place a value on time. How many of you have kids? How many of you have kids who are still young, right? Mine are grown now, but, you know, we try to make birthdays special. But imagine if you were like, hey, Timmy, it's your birthday tonight, but, you know, we had slotted two hours, but we're going to carve that back to 30 minutes, okay? Because we just got a lot on our plate. Like, we're not going to say that to Timmy, right? No, <laughs> Nor are we going to say to all of our kids, just to save time, we're gonna we're just gonna celebrate everyone's birthday at the same time on one night, and we're still gonna make it special. Of course, people are gonna feel good about that. Like we we value we put this value on time and how people feel about us. And so this first section is all about strengthening our connection, strengthening our connection with those that we lead. And there's three words I want you to think about here: affinity, interest, and concern. Affinity, interest and concern. How many of you, how many of you have been to Spain before? Has anyone here been to Spain? Uh, you might have to put yes or raise your hand uh, so I can see it. Has anybody been to Spain? Yeah, a bunch of you. Some of you have not yet. Has anybody been to Malaga, Spain? Has anybody been to Malaga? Do you guys know where that city is? Anybody been to Malaga? No? Okay. What about Barcelona? Has anybody been to Barcelona? For sure. Some of you have been to Barcelona. Joanne has. <laughs> George has. Okay. <clears throat> Joanne and George have both been to Barcelona. We're not going to do it, but if we if we wanted to kind of bring them both on stage and, hey, share with each other your experience in Barcelona, suddenly they would be sharing something that they had in common and sharing experiences. And you went there. Oh, I got to see that. Did you go to the, you know, um, whatever the Sagrada or whatever the temple is called? I've been there. I just can't remember what it's called. Um, did you do this? I did this. What did you what was the most difficult part of Barcelona for you? All this, this, that. And suddenly what we've done is we've created affinity between George and Joanna. Just because there's a shared, there's just something shared. And this is often the first point of a relationship. It's the affinity. Now, if, if you have direct reports that you've had for a long time, then you, you understand this concept. But if you have a new employee, this is one of the first things you want to create is affinity. And this is why getting to know them is important because you will find shared experiences. You want to create affinity between them and the team as well, right? Because, you know, uh, suddenly uh, Jill founds out that Mary is, uh, you know, a wizard at couponing. And she wants to get into couponing. And all of a sudden we've created some affinity. 
we've probably created a conversation at the water cooler. So affinity is always where things start. But let's get down to these other two circles, interest and concern. So why would we, why would we just take an interest in our employees? Like, why would we do that? And I'm not talking about, you know, how's the numbers? Where's the report? Why would we, why would we take interest? Why would you take interest in somebody? Jacqueline says they're human, for sure, because they're people. Right? Because as they are important, all these are right. Because when we take interest in somebody... First of all, we start to learn more. We, we start to paint. We start to fill out the picture. You think about people as like a big blank paint by numbers, right? And when they first start with you, you've, you've only colored in like three of the little squares, which you got from the resume in the interview. And now you're going to start filling in more and more, right? As you, as, you, as you take interest in them, you begin to understand them. That you also find affinity. But also, let's go back to this. <clears throat> hey, when management takes a genuine interest in me, it engages me as a person. It just sends a message. My question is, when do we take interest in people? Because most of us, most of us are running around like this, right? This is just life. So where do we take an interest in people? Yeah, of course, in the meeting, okay, in the elevator, here and there. But the one-on-ones create some space for that. You know, I've seen people come out and talk about one-on-ones and they're like, you know, here's how to do your one-on-one -on -one in five minutes. And my point is, well, oh, you're missing something there. Like, what's the point? What's the point of me shrinking something that is so powerful to five minutes? I remember when one of my, when my kids were younger and, uh, you know, we had this, there was this really exclusive private school, like so close to our house. So we thought, oh, let's go in and see what they what they do. And so they're telling us how like the 10th graders are doing 12th grade work and the 11th graders are already doing first year university and the 12th graders are already doing second year college classes. And, and you know, so many people were impressed by that. And I was like, what's the point in that? Like there's, they're still going to have to do those courses in high school. Why are we pushing these kids so hard? So that's just my value system. Right. But like, what's, what's the point in that? So Interest is, is that, but uh, we get it to a deeper level and that's uh, concern. Now, let me, let me ask you guys this. Um, what should we be concerned about? What are potential things we should be concerned about in our staff? Can you write that in the, in the chat for me? What are potential things we could be concerned about? in the staff. Meanwhile, I'm I'm hunting an unmuter. There we go. There we go. All right. Okay. Engagement, well-being, level of engagement, work-life balance, disengagement, they don't feel valued, things would impact their ability, capacity, Things in their life might be creeping into their workday, dissatisfaction, well-being. Yeah, you guys got it. Quiet quitting, overload. Exactly. So here's the thing about here's the thing about concern. Concern can really come across disingenuous, even when we're genuine, when we're rushed. I could really want my kid to feel special, but if I've shortened the birthday to five minutes because I've figured out how to do that. Uh, they're not going to feel super, uh, super great about it. Like I'm concerned. And so um, this just reminded me, let me just zip down to it. Let's talk about quality over quantity. Um, some of you, you work in situations where you see your staff all the time, every day. Maybe you work in the same shared open space, right? I see my staff all the time. We're always talking. But a mistake that we can make in that setting is like, well, I see them all the time. We're talking all the time. And so there's definitely, there's definitely quantity there, but quantity and quantity is important, but quantity is different than quality. So when these are, well, these are pictures of my girls, uh, this is a number of years ago, back when they were teenagers, I'm probably not, not up for father of the year award, but like my, the one on the left, she was in college. And I just, one day I just called her up, said, Hey, can you take a, 
could you take a week off glasses and let's go to like Columbia? Let's just go on an adventure. So of course she's like, heck yeah. So she, she leaves school for a week. We just go down to Columbia and uh, we just had this adventure together. We're staying in, you know, backpacking hostels. And I hadn't done that since I was like 23. The one on the right, she was in virtual school. So at least I was a little more uh, responsible. And I said, Hey, let's go to Costa Rica. Well, I'll work. You, you do your school. We'll work hard till noon and then we'll go, I go adventure every day. And so, yeah, we did that. <clears throat> but I have to tell you, um, spending an entire week with each of my daughters alone, the levels of the conversation and the depth we got to by the time we got to day five, day six, having conversations about, you know, what do you fear about life? What do you fear about the future? And there is depth is related to time. Of course, you're not going to go spend a, a week somewhere with, with an employee, right? But you can create that week by one-on-one -on -one after one-on-one -on -one after one-on-one. -on -one. You do 12 months of, of consistent one-on-ones. That's time invested, and you're able to create more depth. So if you've not been having one-on-ones or you've not been having consistent one-on-ones, it's okay. Now we're going to start. And don't expect a ton of depth right away. That's totally fine. It's a progression, but just let it grow. And so I asked you this question already. What are some possible things I could be concerned about? And think about it from this perspective. There's personal things, but also work things. Personal things. Hey, how are you doing? Hey, how's your health? Hey, how's um, uh, how's things with your family? Uh, well, I'll give you some more examples in a, in a moment. But what about work? How's, how's your relationships on the team? How do you find the culture here? How do you find the work-life balance? Hey, do you feel, uh, is there something that you feel stressed about because you're, you're not, you're behind in and you're not sure what to do? What I'm looking for is the things that are weighing on them. The things that they're carrying that are a thousand pounds. I may not be able to take that thousand pounds off. I may not even be able to take one pound off, but I'm going to be concerned. That's what I want to be. I want to be concerned. And just the art of the act of being concerned is a tremendous worth to an employee. I shared this story um, in um, my Nine Minutes on Monday program, but I had a friend who was working for the government, and he had just married um, this young woman, and she had a baby. The baby was like one years old, and so he was just an instant father, right? And he was so excited. He was an adopter. And then one day, she comes home and says, hey, I'm leaving you for my coworker at the furniture store where she worked. And just like that, his world upside down. And he has no he has no custody rights or anything. It's not his child, but his world goes upside down. Well, he shows up at work the next day and his boss notices something's different. And she says, hey, everything okay? And he says, he has enough trust in her to confide in her and says, no, here's what happened. And now I literally have to move out of my house on Friday. I don't even know where to get a truck. Uh, I don't even know how I'm going to do all this. And she said, hold on. And she came back like 30 minutes later. She said, I got you a truck. I arranged for two of the guys to take the afternoon off so they can help you move. And thirdly, here's a phone number for government employees if you need to talk with somebody. Right? That's an example of, of a boss that's tuned in to an employee and what's going on for them. She's not trying to be his therapist. right? She's not trying to, to be that. But she's there to try to lift whatever load she can. And so this leads us into this concept of meaningful conversations. Like I mentioned with my daughters, I got time with my daughters when they're, you know, back living with me, but not like when I had isolated each one of them and we had time. And then the conversations became so much more meaningful. And so think about these are, these are potential areas for meaningful conversations, social. Their supporting network, significant others, families, friends, pets. These are all areas for conversation, meaningful conversation, physical health, career. Hey, what do you what do you want to do? You know, if you weren't working here, what would you be doing? Uh, community, because people need to belong to something, right? And so often people are involved in something outside of work. That's a meaningful conversation. Financial, um, you know. Do they need something? Do they need any resources? Do they need any uh, help with budget or uh, anything like that? Right? So financial becomes like, ooh, why would you talk to your 
your staff about financial. Here's how I do it with my staff. At some point, usually in the first couple of months, I will have a conversation with them and I'll say, hey, we want to we want to work out your KPIs so that we can create some performance bonuses because I want I want you to make the most money here that you've ever made anywhere. And I'll ask them, what's the most money you've ever made in a month? Because we want to beat that. That's a financial conversation, but it's it's phrased in a way like I'm just I'm wanting to help you or I'll share things I'm learning about uh, finance. Right. Yeah, I'll share those things. We can have a meaningful conversation. By the way, um, when I send you this uh, guide, it has just a bunch of different ideas for you of things you can check in on, meaningful conversations, both personal and work to give you some, some help there, right? <clears throat> but let's talk about this a little bit because um, this is not intuitive and natural for everybody. When we're doing this check-in, let me just go back up here and, and show you where, where we are so we're in the right, uh, in the right frame. Um, oh, I should have mentioned this. When I start a one-on-one, -on -one, I'm going to first start with agenda. It's going to take 20 seconds. Hey, great that we have this time. What are some things you want to make sure that, you, uh, that we talk about? And they might say, oh, I'm thinking of taking holidays at the end of June. I just want to make sure the dates are okay and also this and this and that. Okay, great. Here's some of the things I want to cover with you. Um, fantastic. Let's dive in. And then I'll go into the then I'll go into the check-in, which is my time to find affinity, or be interested, or be concerned. And once your staff knows that that's the that's what you do, um, it can be more upfront. Like, hey, so uh, I want to know how you're doing, right? So I can say that to my staff because they're they're used to that. I want to know how you're doing, even though I talk to them all the time. So one of our newest employees is a young mom. She's working remotely. She's got an eight year eight month old baby. I hear them every time I, we have a meeting. What would be some potential concerns that maybe I should ask about? What do you think? What would be some potential concerns I might ask about? Jacqueline, have you been sleeping these days? Jacqueline, you must be a mom. Childcare needs. Excellent. Is she getting sleep? How's the baby doing? For sure, right? So that's going to be one of the, the top things on my list. Hey, let's talk about how you're doing. Are you, you know, are you getting sleep? I'm not a doctor. I know that. I'm not a therapist. I know that. But because she knows, I, I want her to do well. And if she's not getting enough sleep, I might, I might even say to her, look, tomorrow morning, why don't you just don't start until like 10. Let's just come in late. Uh, I want you to get sleep. Aging parent care. How's the baby doing? Exactly. So <clears throat> I want to I want to be concerned. And this is genuine interest. Because if it's not genuine, if it doesn't come from a genuine place, it's going to sound like an interview. And interviews put people on edge. Right? That's why we don't rush those conversations. Hey, great to see you, Paula. Um, Hey, here's what we're going to talk about today. What do you want to make sure that we talk about? Awesome. So by the way, how's your sleeping? How's the baby? Uh, how's your cat? Right, I'm just not going to, I'm not going to do that. We're going to have, and nor do I need to cover everything. I don't need to, this isn't the 21 point inspection. I'm just going to, I want to know that they're doing well. Maybe one week I'm going to ask about the baby. Maybe two weeks later, I'm going to talk about Hey, I know you love bike riding, because I know that. Um, have you been able to do any of that? Because I know it's tough when you have a baby. Uh, no, I, but I really want to. I want to do more of that. Yeah, for sure, because that's that's so important to have that exercise. So, you know, um, can you do that this week? Right? I'm, I'm nudging her a little bit because I'm concerned. I want her to do well. And so that becomes the conversation. Um, and there's purpose to these questions. Yeah, new mom life is emotionally exhausting and self-care falls. Exactly. There's purpose to these questions. Every question I'm going to ask, there's a purpose to it. I, I'm, I'm affinity. 
interest, concern. And uh, also, this is a two-way street, so I don't want to get into the thing where I'm only just, this is a one-way. I'm not expecting her to be concerned about me at all, but I, in order for her to be able to share, or any of my staff, in order for them to have meaningful conversations, they also need some vulnerability from me. So in that case, I might say, I totally remember when we had young babies and uh, man, I was like exhausted all the time and up in the middle of the night watching infomercials because the baby wouldn't go back to sleep. And I just remember being like a zombie for like three months. And so if you're like that, I totally get it. All right. So that's a that's a two way street. I'm sharing also I, I can relate. I've been there. Um, and also because my employees are remote, but if you can create a less formal environment for your one on ones, it's great. Like if you have a big company and you have a cafeteria, awesome. Have your one-on-one -on -one there or, um, you know, but don't have it like you at this side of the desk and them at that side of the desk. That's so formal and that's so disconnecting. Uh, maybe go to a, a, a conference room where, you know, you're not at one end and they're at the other, but it's just a different environment where you can have these conversations. By the way, if you have a cafeteria, it's fantastic because you can be like, hey, let's uh, let's meet and head down the cafeteria. And in the ride down, in the elevator, that's where the, just a lot of great conversation happens. Hey, how's uh, how's Joey doing? And blah, 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 blah. And then obviously personal boundaries. Of course, there's just, there's just questions you don't ask. There's things that are not your business that you don't lean into. And uh, uh, that's important. So my question is, what if somebody stonewalls you in this? What if you're trying to take a genuine interest, but they are like one word answers or they might even say, hey, I just don't feel comfortable sharing with you about my life outside of work. Right. What do we do with that? Bill says, accept that and move on. You see, if someone is resistant to that, um, it's typically, it's a trust issue. And their their level of trust is not there with you yet. Now, there are outliers who doesn't matter how much they trust you, they're just not going there. And that's fine as well. But uh, Martha says, let them know why you're interested and that you're trying to build a safe environment. Yeah, share a little about yourself. Exactly. Keep trying. Yeah, so again, when somebody is uh, stonewalls you, you don't press it, don't pry uh, but you can just say, uh, hey, I totally get it, and I wouldn't want you to share anything that you're not comfortable about. But just so you know my intention and my heart, I just want to make sure you're doing well. And they might say, if I'm not doing well, I will tell you, <laughs> right? And then you can be like, okay, I'm going to take your word at it. I'm going to trust you that if you're not doing well, you're going to tell me. Excellent. And it's just kind of redefined your relationship. But those are going to be outliers. And like I said, a lot of times that's just because of um, a lack of trust. Right. So, <clears throat> like I said, there's going to be signs of resistance sometimes. Don't push it. Hey, lead the way. You can share from your own life over time. Just be patient. I bet eventually, at some point, uh, they will open up and let you know. And you know what? They've probably been burned in the past. Uh, they've probably been burned in the past by sharing something and then uh, paying a price for it. And so they're just not going to do that. And yeah. I don't blame them, right? I don't blame them. Now, let's go back up here for a moment. How long should this take, this check-in? Because again, part of it's not just how they're doing personally. I also want to do a work check-in. Hey, let's just talk and, and pick your thing. I mean, it can just be a general, uh, hey, so how are you feeling about working here? How are you feeling about the team? How are you feeling about... Um, the culture here, those are great places to ask about that. By the way, in your, oh, let's see if I find it here. In that guide, no, I don't have it up. In that guide, one of the pages is questions that you would normally ask in a stay interview. You guys heard of a stay interview before, what a stay interview is? A stay interview is you basically, okay, so there's the interview that happens after they've quit, right? Like the postmortem, like, hey, you know, and people don't even tell you the truth on that. 
the stay interview is designed to stop them from quitting by finding out if there's any problems beforehand and are they happy and, and all that stuff. So, um, yeah, so you can just do a stay interview, but to me, a stay interview needs to happen if you're not having one-on-ones, but if you're doing a one-on-one, -on -one, you can take some of the questions from a stay interview and just put them in to, uh, in that check-in on the work section, right? Like a question on the stay interview. Hey, have you ever, have you ever considered uh, moving on and, uh, and finding a new opportunity? Right? That's, a, that's a question in a stay interview. Well, you can ask that in, in your check-in. Hey, if you could change one thing about the culture here, what would you want to change? So anyways, I've given you all questions like that. You can refer, but you can slide one of those in. The goal here is not to fill this with questions and make this an interview because A, you don't have time and they don't have time. But if I'm just going to, I'm just going to be, make sure that, hey, how are you doing personally? I want to know that. And, you know, maybe I'm going to focus in on one thing unless they give me another. Uh, and then about work, I might ask them a question about work. And again, it might be, hey, if you were boss of the company, if you were the CEO, what's one change you would make uh, tomorrow? Right? That's a, that's another way to kind of check in because you're finding out what they don't like, what they'd like to change. So just good stuff. And then we're going to do is we're going <clears> to, <throat> we're also going to say, Hey, before we jump in, right? Like we haven't even got to the one-on-one -on -one yet. Hey, before we jump in, let's share wins and or positive news. And this is a really important step because again, this is part of making your one-on-ones positive, but so many people are just like next goal, next goal, next goal that they don't stop and realize, oh, this is good. Plus, you need to hear it, right? You need to hear what's going good, what's positive. It gives you a chance to recognize whatever they just say, like, hey, this was a win. Oh, yeah, that's right. Fantastic job with, with that. And so, but what you're going to find is, because I do this in every coaching call, right? Every coaching call, I get on with somebody and I say, hey, before we jump in, let's just talk about wins from the last two weeks. And almost every time somebody will say, well, I had this one win and then they share the problem because people just want to go problem and uh, I'll stop them. So, no, let's just stick with the win. What's the win? Awesome. So you're also training your people like let's focus on win. Let's celebrate the wins. So this first section might be five minutes or maybe it's going to be a bit longer, but it doesn't have to take a lot of time. Uh, I can't see it being less than five minutes. Right. That would be pretty rushed. But this could be five minutes, especially if you you're if you're really dialed in already with them. And uh, and you might say, hey, just by the way, like, um, hey, I know that you I know your mom's been going through a tough time health wise. Uh, how's she doing? OK. How's that affecting you? OK. Uh, is there is there what can what can I do or we do as a team to just support you better? OK. All right. So just let me know, though, anytime. And uh, awesome. There we go. That, that could be pretty quick, but I'm, I'm concerned. I'm showing concern. And um, that message is getting sent. All right? It doesn't have to take a long time. Okay. Uh, I want to share this. It's important to, if you want to use an analogy to think about your relationships, all relationships, your, your partner as well, but it's like a bank account. There's deposits and there's withdrawals, right? With your partner, deposits are whatever you did for Valentine's yesterday. A withdrawal would be you didn't do anything for Valentine's yesterday, right? And they are upset with you. Uh, a deposit is, uh, you know, thinking about them and, um, you know, send it, giving them a quick call in the middle of the day. Hey, I was just thinking about you. A deposit is uh, you didn't do what you said you would do or a withdrawal. The same thing with our staff. We have to make withdrawals all the time with our employees. And when I say withdrawal, I mean, I need something. Hey, this needs to be better. Hey, I need to have a conversation with you about your interaction with Steve in the boardroom, right? Those are all withdrawals, meaning there's, there's a negative emotion that goes with those and they have to happen as a boss or else you're not, you're not leading them unless they're perfect. And that's probably not true. So to counter that, there has to be deposits, praise, recognition, uh, care, interest, you know, uh, all the things that I just talked about. And so the one-on-one -on -one is a place to stack the account. 
The one-on-one -on -one is a place to make deposits because you might even be making some withdrawals in this one-on-one. -on -one. That's okay. But we always want to be in the green. We always want to stay positive. Okay. So I'm not being concerned as a management technique. I am being concerned because I really do care. And um, the last thing I'm going to say about this is that general questions will produce general answers. And the more specific and the better we can get at asking questions, the better answers we're going to get, right? So do you like your job versus, hey, which tasks in your job make you feel the most energized and why? That second question is a much better question to have in my one-on-one. -on -one. And um, by the way, I, I, I think in that worksheet, I even gave you examples of general questions, specific questions. So I gave you that as well. Oh, and here's the stay interview. So it's in there uh, for you. Okay, so that's that's the section one. That's what we want to do in our one-to-one. -one. It's about it's about connection and concern. And it doesn't have to take long, but you know what? It might take a little bit longer depending on what's actually going on. So let me hear from you. What's your biggest takeaway so far on this? What's for you as you, because you might be like, oh, I'm already doing this. Awesome. Uh, or maybe you're not. But what's your biggest takeaway from this so far? Well, we got 97 of you guys on the on this call. That's awesome. Good work, everybody. One-on-one -on -one doesn't have to be all business. Making a connection, talking about the wins, having a guide, keeping it positive, separating this from other topics. Yes, genuine concern goes a long ways. Good reminder, it will be worth the time. Move them to a less formal environment, conduct in an informal environment, have an agenda. Yes. Perfect. Not to underestimate the importance of taking time just to chat about things other than work to build connection. Yes. So... Uh, one of the staff members I told you about uh, that's new, she has a side hustle. She wants to start a clothing brand. She's got this little baby and she wants to start a clothing brand. So I always love when staff are entrepreneurial. And so that's another area that I'm interested in, right? Interest. Hey, so how does, how's the, how's the clothing brand going? So you could chalk that up as hobby, right? If, if somebody is doing something on the side, how's that going? Oh, I got this meeting with the designer we're going through designs oh that's so cool uh hey if you feel okay about it share some with me i'd love to see them right interest i'm interested in what you're doing so important okay yeah and uh frida as you said the time needed to build those deeper conversations this doesn't happen if we're not having one-on-ones for sure, it's not happening. And even when we're having one-on-one, -on -one, sometimes it's not happening because it's just we're just business, business, business. But it's okay, slow it down. And if you're worried about like, I don't want to come across like disingenuous, then don't be, don't be, like be genuine. And this will become smoother over time if you've not been used to doing this. Even if you're like, hey, so I want to start being more consistent with one-on-ones and just something I'm trying to get better at as a, as a leader, and uh, but one of the things that is important to me is I I want you to do well. And so when we have these these times, I'm definitely I'm definitely wanting to be asking you like how you're doing. And I'm I'm not trying to pry. I'm just because I want you to do well. I'm just here to support you. Right? Like that's a very honest, genuine conversation. Now they might still resist that, but then you just have some some ways to go with building trust. Okay, fantastic. Let's move on to block number two, which is. I want to make sure you're making progress and being successful. I want to make sure you're making progress and being successful. And so what we're going to do here, we're going to talk about performance, progress, obstacles, and definitely feedback and praise. Now, this is typically what we think of a one-on-one. -on -one. Most people's one-on-one -on -one are only this blue block. And so you might already be pretty good at this, but we're going to talk through that. But let me ask this question. How do you know when you're doing a great job. Like what tells you on Friday when you go home, what tells you that I'm doing a great job? And while you're thinking and writing that in the chat, I will tell you a story 
at a, of a time when I was really struggling to feel like I was doing a good job. I was leading an organization. And I walked by the television one night and I lived in Canada at the time. So hockey is always on. And I see this guy is goaltender and he's warming up and the camera is on him. And I caught myself saying, must be nice. And I was, you know, when you ever like hear yourself say something and you're like, what was that? And it wasn't must be nice that you're making millions of dollars, though that must be nice. The must be nice was you're at the highest level possible and you know you're good at what you're doing. And it just showed to me that there was a there was a thing lacking. I was going through my days feeling like I am sucking at this. And that is never a good problem. Let's see. Uh, someone recognized something I did, employee output, positive productive work environment, feedback from clients, to-do items checked off. Okay. Praise feedback. Nice. We're going to dive into this. <clears throat> so I'm sure a lot of you watch the Super Bowl since the most people watch the event since the moon landing. That's thanks to T-Swift. But, um, you know, what made the Super Bowl exciting? It said, went into overtime. You can only have overtime if you actually keep score, right? Would that would the most people in the world have watched the Super Bowl if there's no score and we're just scrimmaging? Not a chance. Not a chance. Why? We want us. We want a winner. We want a loser. Or if not that we want a loser, but we want stakes in the game. The same way if you go on a road trip. On the road trip. Imagine going on a road trip and you uh, you have no your phone doesn't work you have no map and you're just driving. That's going to wear on your motivation after a while. Like how how far are we from Buffalo, Wyoming? Right? It's because there's I want to know, and this kind of brings up the 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 correlation between us measuring something and having feelings about it. So, what we want people to do when they come out of this section is I know how I'm doing and I'm clear on next steps. So think of that as the goal of this section. Like the last section was, my boss cares about me. The next one is, I know how I'm doing and I'm clear on my next steps. I, I might not even be doing well, but at least I know. I know I'm not doing well, but I'm clear on the next steps and that creates hope for me. Right? So one of the things we want to do in the one-on-ones is we want to try to think broader themes. And um, sometimes that's difficult. But once you think about it in this way, everyone needs a mountain to climb. Everybody needs a mountain to climb because this is a piece of, of intrinsic motivation. When you have a clear goal or a clear expectation, maybe it's not a measurable number, but when you have clarity on this is where I need to get to and this is where I am, it creates a gap. And that gap creates what we call the psychological principle of striving. Striving is, is when you're, you're pushing forward, you're pursuing something. Nobody's pushing me in the back to get me there. I am. It's pulling me there, right? Because that's coming from within. And this is where you want your staff. But this whole thing about striving breaks down when people don't have clarity and when they're not getting feedback. So mountains create striving. That's why they need a mountain. And here's how we do it. There has to be clear goals or expectations. When at all possible, some kind of a measurement, some kind of a time frame, and some kind of feedback on progress. And that's how you move from neighbor three to neighbor two to neighbor one. Clear goal or expectation, measurement, a time frame, feedback on progress. Check this out. This is from Penn State. Since it was first researched five decades ago, goal setting theory has been the most researched, utilized, and established theory of work motivation in the field of industrial and organizational psychology. The most researched and established. One of the most replicable findings in all psychological literature is that challenging and specific goals lead to an increase in performance. And this one, if there is ever to be a viable candidate from the organizational sciences, 
for elevation to the lofty status of scientific law of nature, then the relationship between goal difficulty, specificity, and performance are most worthy of serious consideration. So in other words, they've studied this to death. And it's just one plus one equals two. Challenging goal that's specific leads to an increase in performance. It just does. And if it doesn't, there's probably something wrong with the person. That's how ingrained it is into our human nature, right? And so our job is to make sure that people are on a mountain and to inspect progress and assist it. That's where that's what we need to do. And this is also an accountability point, right? Accountability just means to be counted. We tend to relate accountability to something bad, right? Like I'm going to be held accountable. Account is just, we're going to count it. We're going to count how you're doing. So you're the receptionist at the front of the medical uh, office here. We're going to count how you're doing, right? How would you do that? Well, there's a way. You're going to count how to do that. And so what I find when it comes to uh, performance progress is the number one problem is there's nothing to measure. Like there's nothing to measure. And so what happens is you have these one-on-ones and you, you check in and it's, and you're, you know, might be looking at the project or like, you know, how are we going here? And there's kind of progress. It's not that there's not something to measure, sure. but sometimes this is where things get difficult. So let me ask you this. <coughs> Excuse me. I asked you to uh, to think of one employee at the start of this. Like, let's think of one employee as we go through this entire process. What do you currently measure? Now, maybe it's nothing, and that's fine. Um, but what do you currently measure with them? Maybe if you can type that in the chat. Martha says progress towards deadlines. What do you measure? Overdue activities, says Lexi. What do you currently measure? Attendance and training, milestones and projects, a plan review times, recording says performance on daily mail activities, suspense and client feedback, Rebecca performance against goals, performance daily, productivity, quality of work. Okay, good. So a bunch of you have things that you measure. Let's zoom out for a moment. And uh, you know, when I when I so one of the one of the big things we do is we we'll go into organization, we'll work with the senior team. And one of the things that we work with the senior team, because this is going to affect you, what I'm what I'm about to say. One of the things that we talk to the senior team about is that there has to be this cascading alignment all the way down through your organization. And it starts with your your North Star, right? That's the the mission, vision, values that you work so hard to come up with that half your employees don't know what they are. Right, but that's where it begins. But what what's next? And we talk about so we talk to them about having a mountain to climb, and in that context, we're talking about their strategic plan, three year, three to five year vision, usually a three year vision, right? What's the three year vision? Because that's the mountain that everyone's climbing, but typically people don't feel it or they don't know it. Or they have, they're so disconnected from the strategic plan or it's so complex. If it's on a board, they don't understand it. But what's the mountain that we're climbing? So for those of you who are not in the C-suite, this is not your job, right? Your job is not to come up with that strategic vision. That's what they're paid to do. They might bring you in on that conversation. Awesome. But, uh, you know, that's, that's their responsibility. Where it's our responsibility is we need to be able to translate that three-year or whatever the strategic plan is down into our world. What does this mean for the janitorial department of this hospital? What does that mean for us? Because otherwise it's just, let's show up and let's clean our floors and let's desanitize sanitize everything and do what we're supposed to do. That's a treadmill. But we can make things more exciting by tapping into what's, where are we going as a hospital this is what this this is what the executives have said. And now let's break this down. And how do we do that? We break this down into 90 day sprints. So let's take a three year, let's take a three year um, strategic plan. Well, that is 12 
90 day sprints. That is 12 units of measurement. A quarter is a really good measurement. Not too long where we lose momentum, not too short that we can actually accomplish quite a bit. And I would encourage you to think like this. Even if your organization's not, you know, thrusting this upon you, I'm just here to share with you, this is how you're going to get the best out of your staff. You have to get them on a mountain. Of course, the mountain that, that's already been picked for you, but you got to get them onto that mountain. And how do you do that? You've got to break things down into 90-day sprints. In those 90-day sprints, you're going to have some you're going to have some compelling scoreboards, right? These are going to be some kind of KPIs, OKRs, or other phrases you might use for them. And then from that, we're going to have a communication cadence and accountability. And part of that accountability point comes in the one-on-one. -on -one. And so if, if we don't have it set up like this, it just makes it more difficult to have your one-on-one. -on -one. Doesn't mean you can't, doesn't mean you can't talk with them through their performance, but it's just going to make it more difficult. So I want to talk about this for a little bit. I'm going to show you, um, like when we're coaching companies, what we help them install, also what we do in our company. And so think of it like the 90 day sprint, right? You have 12 quarters to reach the top of this mountain, whatever this is. Each quarter is like a self-contained unit of focus. And this is how you create the alignment necessary to stay on track and inspire the maximum potential out of your staff because deadlines create, there's that piece of a deadline that creates striving. Remember, that's what we're after. How do we create striving? How do we tap into that psychological principle that is the law of nature? That's what we want to do. And so um, we use these 90-day sprints and then we, we make sure that we have some kind of a compelling scoreboard. Now, let me ask you guys this. How many of you have, uh, how many of you use KPIs with your team? Because your company probably has KPIs. Most company has some key performance indicators. But how many of you use KPIs in your team? Let's see. We got, I got over 90 people here. We got only a handful of you do, unless some of you are just not typing in, which is fine. I'm not your boss. I'm not the boss of you. We do client retention, organic growth. Martha says no. All right. For those of you who are not using KPIs, I really want you to begin to think, how can I use this? So typically KPIs are, are really heavily pushed on revenue stuff, right? And that's why people started talking about a balanced scorecard, right? Let's not just measure revenue. What are other things we can measure that's more balanced, right? Can we measure, you know, um, employee learning? Can we measure uh, work-life balance? Whatever it is that's important to you. But if you don't have KPIs, and OKRs, I'm going to encourage you to have them. I'll walk you through what that looks like. And then right after we intubate, we do want to get a satin chest x-ray to confirm replacement. With that being said, uh, sometimes if you have time, you can drop an NG. I would recommend doing that because then you don't have to get another repeat like 10 minutes afterwards once you get it. However, if you don't have time, we do recommend doing that because then you don't have to get another repeat like 10 minutes afterwards once you get it. However, just be cognizant. If you have a patient with an upper GI, you'll need a history of uh, alcohol use, your concern for esophageal varices or any facial fractures, don't just... Found them. Okay. Good. It's actually like a fun little game. It's like hunting names and then you just click and then it's all quiet. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. <clears throat> In my world. <laughs> Excuse me. We've got 20 more minutes. We're going to take a break. So, so hang with me here. This is really important stuff. Let's let's talk about KPIs and OKRs. By the way, um, OKRs, you might not uh, have heard of that term. It's totally fine if you haven't, but we're going to walk through that. Um, so KPIs, these are numbers that measure the health of your business or just think of your team, right? Measures that uh, well, measure the health of your team. They could be the result of a leading indicator, right? Like something you do, you know, in the future. Uh, so, for example, sales calls. Sales calls is a leading measure, meaning we can, if we do a lot of sales calls, it's probably going to mean we're going to get more sales, right? So that's a leading indicator. Of course, it could be a lagging indicator, like what's the actual score? 
uh, monitors what's happening now. So KPI, like this is in real time, here's what's happening and it should prompt action if the numbers get off track, right? That's where we calibrate. And it's usually measured on an ongoing basis throughout the year. Of course, it can change from time to time. OKRs, uh, I forget the guy who came up with the OKRs. I think it was the guy that started Oracle. You can correct me if I'm wrong on that. What OKRs, you can kind of think of them as goals, to be honest, um, but they're, they're done a little bit differently. The O stands for objective. Uh, John Dort, thank you. Thanks, Chelsea. Action-oriented goals, they're objectives. And then they have measures, which are key results. So think of those like the steps. They're very future focused, uh, directional. They should be aggressive and bold and help move the needle on something important. And they have a set time period, usually quarter to quarter. Right? So here's where we bring in those quarterly measurements. So think of it a little bit like this. The KPIs are the dashboard, right? Like here's how fast I'm driving, how much fuel I have. Here's where my the engine temperature is. OKRs are the temporary like problems to fix and improvements to make once you've passed a waypoint, you move on to the next one. That's a good way to look at, at OKRs. But let's just, let's talk about KPIs for a moment. So every staff member should have at least one KPI they're responsible for. Uh, one of the guys we were coaching in uh, that went through our program, uh, everyone in his organization and they're in manufacturing has one number. So even though some of them have many KPIs, they still boil it down to, but what's your most important number? What's your one number? Right? And that gives people that focus and direction. But every staff member should have at least one KPI they're responsible for. So the medical re receptionist, what's that number? Well, I don't know. But what would indicate that they are doing a great job? And a great thing that you can do is ask them. Like, hey, if we were going to come up with a KPI for you, what would that be? And if you need some help, honestly, you can go into Google, you can go into ChatGPT, and you could say, what are some possible KPIs for a medical receptionist? And you'll get a list of 25 possible things. Now, you're not going to use all those, but like, let's grab one. More importantly, let's let him or her pick one. And that's going to be a measure that we're going to use. Now, they might pick a couple. Maybe it's waiting time. Maybe it's uh, no, uh, number of mistakes um, in in phone calls or whatever. I hate measuring mistakes because look at it from our world. This is uh, our staff member who is in charge of social media marketing. This is their KPIs. Every week, this is tracked: content published, post likes, post shares, post comments. So if you're on LinkedIn and you like you like a post or you share a post, she gets, in a sense, credit for that. So keep that in mind. But anyways, these, this is her KPIs. And there's one that's uh, highlighted there because that's the one number above all the number. Hey, if there's one number above all the numbers, it's new people that jump onto our email, uh, our, our new email list. That's your most important number, right? So this is a very tangible thing. Of course, we can measure that. You always love it when you can measure something very tangibly, but not everything is as tangible. Robert says comments from patients. Yeah, that could tell us something, right? Or if you do a, a net promoter score. So I think I asked you already this, what KPIs you already measured. So again, I want you to think about this because when I go into a one-on-one, -on -one, I can go, so let's say for her, before I go into the one-on-one, -on -one, I know what's going on. Like, it's not like I'm just going in blind. I know what's going on, and I know if there's a, a, a place that is not great, okay, I'm, I'm going to be curious about that and say, hey, let's chat about this and, and what's happening here, right? So I'm going to do that. That's KPIs. Let's talk about OKRs. So objectives are defined as what you want to achieve these outcomes should be expressed in a strong, motivating way, very aspirational. Uh, that's why they're a little bit different than goals. Key results are how you will achieve an objective. Key results can either be quantifiable performance measures or deliverables. And it looks a little bit like this. Again, they're goals that inspire for the quarter. They are steps uh, 
that measure progress towards uh, the objective. And then the initiatives, of course, are the in the daily trenches. And what happens is OKRs give your give your people a place on the mountain. So you have your, I'm just going to go back to the medical receptionist. Okay, as a medical clinic, here's what we're trying to do in the next three years. We're trying to open three more clinics. So I want my staff member who works as a receptionist, what's her piece in us creating three new clinics? Well, um, do you think it would be good if, we, if we'd worked out an SOP on the perfect model of being the, the face of the organization? Would that be a, a good goal to work on? Of course, and that ties in, right? And so now we're getting her to think or him to think differently about their role. This is something bigger. And so quarter by quarter, how could we break that down into goals, into OKRs? And so let's just say we're in Q1. But now because we're speaking differently about this, they might think, okay, you know what one objective I'd like to come up with? I'd like to really standardize how we collect information and store it because I don't think what we have is really efficient. Awesome. Then that becomes an objective for him or her during the quarter in that 90-day sprint. So what am I going to do when I have our one-on-one? -on -one? I'm going to check in on that. But because we track OKRs, I before I even get there, I can I have some semblance of how they're doing. So <clears throat> I don't want to get into a whole course and class on OKRs and KPIs here, but to me, this is just understanding that if you have this set up, it makes your one-on-one so much easier. One-on-ones become difficult when this stuff is not in place. Because now it's like, okay, so um, how you feel like you're doing in your job? I think I'm, I feel like I'm doing pretty good. Yeah, I think you're doing pretty good. Okay, great. Let's move on. Right? So that doesn't bring them out of this. Remember I talked about the goal of this? I know how I'm doing and I'm clear on next steps. Why? Because we want to tap into that principle of striving. We want to get the best out of people. Because not only does that help the company, but that helps them. Everybody wants to be able to bring their best and it does something for us. So an OKR cycle looks like this, right? It's this 13 week cycle. And so, you know, what we do is when we finish one quarter, we'll do a retrospective. We'll talk about what we learned, what went well, what didn't went, whatever. And then we'll talk about, okay, we're heading into the next quarter. Um, I need everybody to think through their OKRs and, and submit them. Right now, I might give them some as well. Uh, weekly check-ins, that's usually in our team meeting. We'll just weekly check in. But my one-on-one -on -one check-ins, which I do every two weeks, my one-on-one -on -one check-ins, that's where we can I can go deeper dive. Hey, what's the challenges? What's the obstacles here? Um, and have that conversation. So the monthly review, these are monthly review. That's a meeting, team meeting, quarterly retrospective, right? But what I'm doing, see if I can do this on the fly. What I'm doing is I'm having, I'm having a one-on-one, -on -one, right? I'm having one here. I'm having one here. I'm having one here. I'm having one here. So I will shoot for every two weeks to have a one-on-one. -on -one. And so every two weeks, every staff member is getting my full attention on helping them climb this mountain. We want to get them on a mountain to climb. Okay. You'll have all these slides. You can go back and review this, but basically when, when you're getting people to set OKRs for the quarter, right? Here's questions to ask. Is this meaningful? Is it audacious? Is it inspiring? All right. So let's, let's have some fun here. So let's go back to the medical receptionist. Hey, I, I want you to, to think about some, some objectives for the quarter. I want them to be meaningful. I want them to be audacious, be a bit bold with this. And I want it to be inspiring to you. That's the criteria. And then the key results, that's more like, how, how am I going to get there? You know, here's the plan. Okay. So think about it for you. Let's talk about Q2, which is six weeks away. Right. What OKR could you create for your role in Q2? 
right? If there was one objective that you were going to put into play for Q2, what would that be? What would be, what would be meaningful? What would be audacious? And what would be inspiring for you in your role? And so, you know, you might have several OKRs. So what I'm going to do is, and by the way, as a leader, I am responsible for my OKRs and the entire team sees them. And that's that helps you create a, a culture of, of learning and accountability when you're also accountable. And so I know my numbers. My staff know my numbers. And if my numbers are low, it's my fault. And it affects everyone else, right? So one of my numbers is revenue. And so if revenue is, is low, that's on me. But it also impacts them. And they get to see that. They see, they see all my OKRs. And so this is how we work as a team. And I'm accountable. So some of you are in bigger organizations, and you're going to probably already have fancy software to track OKRs. But for the rest of you who don't, uh, I'm going to send you an KPI and OKR tracker. It's just a simple one, but actually we use it. Uh, it looks like this. This is for the KPIs. Uh, and it's just it's in Google Sheets, so you can just copy and paste it. And this is the OKR template. And you can just go ahead and use that. And there's a video there explaining a little bit more on how to use it. And so I'm going to, I'll make sure you get that as well. That'll be in the resource section uh, after you get this. Okay. So just a few minutes left, but before we take a break and then, um, every quarter we reset the board on the OKRs, not the KPIs, but the OKRs, we reset the board, we pick a theme. We have a theme for the quarter. We create new, new OKRs, some for the company. Uh, and then, uh, people are going to help create their own. And then of course our job in my one-on-ones is to inspect progress and assist. And this is where we come into accountability. So let's at least kick off this before we take a break. If you're going to have measures, you got to have accountability. You got to count them, right? Keeps your organization on track. It provides feedback. It helps them experience mastery, right? So they know how they're doing and it gives the opportunity for praise and recognition. Accountability also shines light in the gap. So like our person in charge of social media, it could be like, hey, why are our email subscribers so low? Let's talk about this, right? I'm not blaming her, but like, let's talk about this. She might say, because you're putting out lousy content, so nobody wants to join, like, you know, whatever. It's a, it's a team thing. But the key to accountable cultures is ownership. It's getting people to own what they're doing. And that's why that process of, of KPIs, OKRs, where they are getting a chance to, to create them and submit them is so powerful, right? And so in the one-on-ones, we're going to have these accountability conversations. And you've got to review your metrics before you go into the meeting. Have your list of questions ready to go. Right? And this is another reason why there should be a note section on your KPIs and OKRs. So uh, for those of you, if you're going to use the little uh, the tool I'm going to give you, you'll, you'll find there's a note section. What I mean is our staff will go in they'll update their KPIs and OKRs. And if they're behind, they'll put a little note. Here's, here's what's happening, right? So I have some information before I'm going in. But look, accountability, it's a time where we inspect the expected. And when the gap has not closed sufficiently, there's a problem. Doesn't mean they're the problem, but there's a problem. And this is where we have to get thinking more as leaders, like when we're not closing the gap, it's a problem. And we have to solve this. And so where do we lean? We lean in with curiosity. Hey, what's going on here? What's the problem? <clears throat> Them first. Before you say, here's the problem. Here's why you're not hitting your numbers. No. What's the problem? Hey, Joey, what's the problem here? Why are we, why are we, why are we missing this so much? Right? I even use inclusive language, by the way, when I do that. Why are we missing this so much? Um, why are we missing this so much? And they're going to share, and I, I might share. I think that's right, but I also I also think this. Right, we're trying to get some clarity and commitments. By the way, when performance is below the line, here's just some here's just five good questions to ask yourself. 
Of course, perform performance can't be below the line if there's no line, which is why we want there to be lines. When someone's below the line, were the expectations clear? Sometimes they weren't. Do they have the tools and resources they need? Do they have the ability to do what I'm asking for? Like maybe they don't have that skill yet. Are there external factors at play? Or is there a desire slash motivation? Is this a desire motivation issue? So before I leap into somebody, which I don't do anyways, but if I'm going to be tempted to get on somebody about them not holding the line, I, I want to go through these questions. And I might even ask them some. And um, <clears throat> in the resource thing that I'm sending you, I've given you, uh, well, first of all, I've given you 20 recognition ideas so that you can just helps you think potential things to recognize your staff during the one-on-one. -on -one. But I've also given you this sheet on sentence starters. So there's 10 for recognition and there's 10 for performance management. So sometimes it's just an awkward conversation for us. And sometimes these sentence starters can, can just can help you. So anyways, it's there just as a resource to help you out. But that's the idea is we want to get into how are they doing? And let's just go back to the goal here. This is how I want them to come out of this section of the one-on-one. -on -one. I know how I'm doing and I am clear on next steps. If we can check that box after that, awesome. This potentially is the longest part of your one-on-one. -on -one. Now, again, this could be five minutes. Everything's going great. We're doing fantastic. This is so good to hear. I'm really impressed with how you're doing this and this and that. You're ahead of schedule. Why do you think, why do you think you're doing so well, right? Um, how do you think some of your strengths can help the rest of the organization, right? I might throw in some other questions. Uh, lots of praise and everything. But anyways, that, that might be a five-minute conversation. Or we might have to dig into a problem here. So the, the last thing I'll say before we break, remember I said this has to be a very disciplined meeting. You have to avoid getting sucked down into a rabbit hole where now it's just like a regular working meeting. If we're going to have to dive deeper on a problem, then schedule that. Just say, okay, obviously there's, there's more here that we're going to have to solve that we, we don't have time for today. So uh, let's, let's have a meeting. Uh, let's get this scheduled tomorrow because we, we've got to take care of this. You know, if, if it's a fire that, that it's okay to burn like a few more hours or one more day, great. Like try to do that because you still have one more thing to cover in your one-on-one. -on -one. And that's the coaching piece, the development piece, which is really important. And it's the piece that always gets shoved out because people are in their one-on-ones and now they're in problem-solving mode. And we love being in problem-solving mode because that's what we do as leaders. We problem-solve. So now we're solving the problem. 45 minutes goes by and we're like, okay, good. We solved that problem. And now we're ending the meeting. And so you kind of you cut your one-on-one -on -one kind of off at the knees in terms of what you want to accomplish, right? I want to make sure you're doing well. I want to make sure you're having success and making progress. I want to make sure you're growing and I want to make sure you're in the loop. We want to make sure we get those last two in. So let's do this. We're going to take a, um, we're going to take a 10 minute break. So I have mountain time, 931, 932. So let's do this at 942. 11.42 for you in the East. Let's come back here. And we're going to go through uh, the last two sections, although the, it's one big section. It's about coaching. How to, take, how to take a very limited amount of time and really help your, your staff develop. And I'll share with you some of the ways I coach and how I coach my staff, also how I coach CEOs and stuff. And so uh, I hope that'll be helpful. All right. See you guys in 10 minutes.
I lost James sound. Did anybody else lose it? Oh, okay. I also lost sound. Okay. We can't hear you, James. <laughs> what about now? Perfect. <laughs> Funny thing about the mute button. So you guys heard nothing I said in the last five minutes? Maybe not. All right. But well, you can hear me now. Okay. <clears throat> Have any of you heard of The Moth? It's like a storytelling competition. Have any of you heard of that? Martha, you're waving, you're nodding your head. Have you been to The Moth, Martha? No. I'd never heard of The Moth. The Moth is basically a storytelling competition that's all over the nation. I think it started in New York. And it's just a bunch of people show up and they put their names in the hat, those that want to go in the hat, and they pull 10 names out during the night. Those 10 people get up to tell a five-minute story. There's a judging panel. They judge and they pick a winner. So this has been going on for like 10 years. I had no idea. I was reading a book on storytelling because it's my craft, right? I do this for a living. And that's when the guy was telling about the moth and how he discovered it. And he went to one and put his name in and then he ended up winning. And like that led to all these things. And I'm like, I should do that. I should go. I mean, literally I tell stories for a living. It would be a good challenge for me. So I, um, I look one up and there's one, I live in Denver. And so there's one, there's one in Denver and it turns out that it's like in three days. And I'm like, I felt that little bit of nervousness. Like, should I do it? And I'm like, yeah, you need to do it, right? Like, you always need to challenge yourself. And I talked to the our team about that as well. Like, challenge yourself. Like, have a growth mindset. Be willing to fail. I'm like, okay, I'm going to do this. So I decided to do it. And then for some emotional support, I called my three children. Like, hey, I'm doing this. Like, do you guys want to come with me? And so they're like, yeah, sure. So I go to show up. You don't even know if you're going to get picked, right? Because like, it's all these names. And uh, of course, I'm late. And uh, by the time I get there, I'm figured, okay, well, I, I missed it, but they hadn't started yet. And down at the front, there's like a guy there with his hat. And I go down, I'm like, is it too late to put my name in? He's like, no. And so I, I write my name in, he puts it in the hat. And there were no seats left at this time. I had to go up to the balcony. So I go up to the balcony. My kids were already there. They'd save me a seat. And I sat down and then I just had this moment where I thought, what have I just done? Because I've never been to one of these events. I don't even know the style. Like, I've never even watched a video of someone telling a story at these events. And uh, I turned to my daughter and I said, I think I just made a mistake. And I said, as long as I don't get picked first. And no sooner had I said that, they're like, our first storyteller of the night, James Robbins. And I was like, no. And so I, I get out of my seat and crawl across an aisle and I go down and I'm walking like a lamb to the slaughter. And I, I go and I'm waiting backstage and this, this uh, organizer, she's like, uh, she's been real sweet. She's like, uh, oh, hey, you know, it'll be okay. And she's like, just, you know, do you know your first line? It's just kind of coaching me through. And I'm like, okay, thank you. And um, so I get up and I, you have five minutes to tell a story and you have to put this one word in. They just give you a random word. You have to include it. So anyways, I tell the story, I go long. I go over my time. I don't use the word, but still, it's a good story. has all the right elements. And by the time I'm done, the judges give me a score, and I'm in first place because <laughs> I'm the only one that's gone. But anyways, by the end of the night, I ended up in sixth place in the storytelling competition. Sixth place. And I'm driving home, and I got to say, I'm a little bit ego hurt, right? I'm a bit ego hurt because I'm thinking... There is no way that anyone in that audience has more time on the platform than me, like 2,500 presentations. And I just got wiped out in a local storytelling competition. And um, so I said to my friend, I said, like, that's actually pretty funny. And then, I, you know, I got over it and, uh, and tried to laugh about it. But it's one of the things I've, I've tried to instill in my kids, right? Like try things, fail things, like learn from them. And, and you know, now I'm like, OK, I will go back and I will I will do this again. The reason I'm telling this, as me on stage, by the way, just about to bomb. The reason I'm telling this story is because one of the best things you can do with your team is create a learning culture. And you guys have probably heard about fixed mindset versus growth mindset. 
based off of Carol Dweck's work. It's part of what contributes to psychological safety. This idea that it's okay to fail. Every mistake, we should learn something from this, right? Oh, you made a mistake? Okay, good. What's the lesson? How do we make sure we don't make this in the future? And it promotes risk taking because we want that. We want our, um, we had a, our, our social media person posted something on LinkedIn the other day and I'm like, what, what is that? Like I had to delete it. And then I, I talked to them and they're like, well, I was just, I was trying this. I'm like, okay, I appreciate, I appreciate that. Appreciate the creativity, but that's not correct. So <clears throat> the reason I say this is because this is what's going to help you in this next section on coaching, the learning and development piece, because the desire here is I want to make sure you're growing. I want to make sure you're growing. And you know, why would we coach people? It's one of the most effective ways to help an employee grow. It's how we increase their engagement. It makes an employee feel cared about and invested in because they know you're busy. It increases the intrinsic motivation. That's what we're after, right? 34% more committed, 46% more satisfied on the job. That's what McKinsey found. It creates more self-starters. It increases employee competence and satisfaction. Now, <clears throat> when I was... Um, when my daughter was 15, she broke her shoulder in a cheerleading accident. And a, a year later, she'd healed. She got back into cheer. And then uh, she one day she told us, hey, I want to quit. And we were surprised by this, right? Because she really loves it. And we're like, well, okay, if that's what you want to do. Uh, and we're not those parents like, you signed up. You have to stay in it. But anyways, if you are, that's totally fine too. But we were fine with it. And then uh, one day, out of the blue, we get this text. She says, okay, never mind. I want to stay in tumbling. She said, Coach Mel was there and was pushing me and I did my standing tuck. So I'm happy. And this is the correlation between our growth and how we feel and how we feel about ourselves. And uh, my, my program, Nine Minutes on Monday, which is for managers to help them motivate their staff better. This is a major piece of this, right? We talk about the need to grow and develop. But here's the thing. All growth begins with clarity. All growth begins with clarity. And really, it's one simple question. What's going to make, put the employee's name in there, more effective? What's going to make them more effective? And at any given time, every one of your people should be working on something. This is easier when there's a growth culture, right? You guys can always talk about this, but everyone should always be working on something. And of course, we play a big part in the development of our staff. And... That development is going to come in, in a couple of different forms, right? So let's just talk about some of these definitions. Teaching. That's a transfer of knowledge, classes, courses, webinars, processes. I'm teaching right now, right? We're in a classroom setting. And uh, it's not always the best setting. It's just we're trying to get information across. I can't control what you do with it, though, right? So it's going to be up to you. Uh, there's consulting. That's a little bit different. That's where the consultant comes in and says, here's the path you need to go on and uh, they outline it for you. Here's the mountain you need to climb. You're probably not gonna be doing consulting with your staff. There's mentoring. Mentoring is, it's like coaching, but mentoring means you've already done it. You've been there. You've been an HR manager and now you can help the next one. You've, you've sold insurance in the trenches and now you're a manager of people selling in the trenches. You've been there, so you can mentor. You can provide advice based on the journey that you've been there. I've been there, done that. But then there's coaching and coaching is a bit different, right? Coaching asks the employee to self-identify and self-direct. It's based on the assumption that the employee actually knows probably more, no, that they do more than they think they do. Maybe they just need to trust themselves more. Coaching makes the unconscious conscious. Coaching helps the employee gain insight, discovers blind spots. Coaching shifts beliefs on how people think, and that's why coaching is transformational. And so coaching is both for, we coach for performance and for development. Now, let me ask you guys this. What do you find is the most difficult about coaching your staff? You can just type that in the chat for me. What's the most difficult thing that you find in coaching your staff? What would you say? Different levels of commitment, their willingness to accept help, treating others with respect, 
getting them to self-identify, switching to coaching instead of mentoring, defensive response, hard conversations, lack of self-awareness, all of the above, says Dottie. All right, I want you guys, as many as you can, type this in the chat. I want you to think about one of your directs. So we've been, I asked you to think about one employee as you go through this. What is one thing that if they improved, they would be better at their job? Maybe they get more confident, better time management, better sales closing skills, better rapport with the uh, client, better um, leadership skills, clear communication, not cut the corners on the process, confidence, attention to detail, patience, attention to detail, adapting to change, more confidence, clear communication, less bickering within the team. That's a complex one. That's a fun one to deal with, right, Morgan? Okay. So as you guys are, this is great, by the way, you're putting all these amazing things in. Now think about this. We can almost put all of your answers in one of two buckets. There is the skill and knowledge acquisition, and there is a personal development. And some of them are kind of a, a little bit of both, right? Like um, prioritizing. Okay, there's a skill to that. Uh, taking ownership. That's not necessarily a skill as much as it is developing as a person, right? Personal development. Confidence, that would be personal development. So a lot of development is going to fall into one of those two buckets and maybe some is going to be in the middle, right? So maybe somebody's got to get better at uh, asking for the sale, right? Well, there's a skill to that, but there's also a confidence piece to that. So again, some are going to bridge, bridge both. So how do you do that though? How do you approach that? So let me just give you just a quick tip. One is that when it is a personal development piece, really try to lean into coaching. In other words, the more they can develop themselves as you're guiding them, it's going to be easier because more ego is involved and people are going to be more defensive. When it's skill-based, then it can be a little bit more mentoring and uh, like, hey, you've got to do this, you got to do that, right? But here's the nice thing about coaching. The good news about coaching is you don't have to be the expert. Like, you don't have to be the expert. You don't have to be in this lofty teaching uh, position. This reminds me of Doug Blevins. He was the kicking coach for the Miami Dolphins, probably going to get added to the NFL Hall of Fame. The guy's never kicked a ball in his life. And yet, he coached at the highest level. How is that possible? Because you don't have to have done something to be able to help someone else do something. That's a really important lesson to understand, right? At the same time, coaching doesn't have to take a lot of time. Uh, I don't know why it goes back 15 years ago. I was just like, let's find a new hobby. And so we were like, uh, my wife at the time, we decided we would join this adult gymnastics gym. It was literally like a big play place for adults. But anyways, there was like one coach and 25 adults doing stuff to injure themselves. And um, I'm thinking like, how can he help us? But anyways, he would just make the rounds. And I was trying to learn how to do like a, whatever that's called, a handstand and you flip over. There's a word for it. And um, so he would come by, what are you working on? I'm like, oh, I'm trying to do this. He goes, okay, let me see it. And then I'd, I'd run and you know, I'd fall on my, my rear end. He's like, okay, great, great, great. He goes, now here's the one thing I want you to do. I want you to lock your arms this time and let's do it again and you'll see the difference. And so I do it and this time I land on my knees, right? And he's like, okay, fantastic. He goes, just keep working on that. I'll come back around. And then sure enough, he came back around, I think once more during the night. Okay, let me see it. And then, okay, do this. Okay, excellent. And I was making progress, but I was only get coached. It was just these little moments, right? And that's where his expertise came in for sure. So this is where, where coaching is going to help. Now, um, let me show you what I do with coaching. Let me show you what I do when I'm first starting off coaching. So let's say you've not been coaching your, um, you've not been coaching an employee and you're like, okay, I should start doing that. Can you guys see a white screen? Yeah. All right. Um, I'm very visual, so I'll usually draw this out on paper and, uh, we'll just call him Joey. 
I'll say, hey, Joey. I'll say this. Hey, Joey, left to our own. We, we follow a familiar path in life because we have our own patterns and, and we just sort of keep looping the same life over and over. But if we want to grow, uh, it takes intention, right? We have to be intentional about it. And so what I want to know is, and I'll say something like this, I'll say, let's imagine it's uh, the Christmas party uh, of 2024. And we're at the Christmas party how when you when you look back over the year what do you most want to have Im improved like who's joey in 2024 of december versus joey now and that's where i'm going to start because i want them to i want them to tell me where they want to grow so for those of you who have employees that are resistant to coaching sometimes they're resistant because they feel like something's being forced on them so instead let them let them be the one let them be the self-coach. So you're going to be the catalyst for it, but it's going to be, hey, so what I say when I'm like an exterior client, I'll say, hey, let's say the CEO comes up to you at the Christmas party and says, oh my goodness, I'm so proud of you. I can't believe how much you've grown because now you're this. What is the CEO saying? So I'll get them to think like that and then they'll, they'll come up with stuff. Uh, I wanted this and this and this and this. And then we'll talk about, okay, well, where are we now? What are the problems now? And they'll start listing out problems. And we have a base to start with. And what I do, just sharing what I do, is I will then take, so let's say somebody does say confidence, right? I want to get more confident. Now, maybe they don't say confidence, but I know they need to. I'm going to hear their list, but then I almost, I, I'm going to also say, hey, do you can I throw in something? Do you think if you became more confident, it's going to help you in, in, in what you do? And they might be, oh, yeah, that's right. I forgot to say that. Hey, yeah, because I see that. You've got so much talent. I feel like sometimes you, you, you hold yourself back. Right? So let's say uh, they come up with a bunch of things. Let's say confidence is on this list here, though. Well, what I'm going to ask them is, I'm going to ask them, how, how are you going to do that? How are you going to do that? Because they're expecting me to tell them, right? They're expecting me to tell them. I'm not going to tell them. I could because I, I know the path, but I'm not going to tell them. So how are, you going to, how are you going to do that? Well, I don't know. Can you think of some resources that you could tap into or people that you could tap into? And they might be, I have to think about that. And then I'll say, okay, why don't you think about that? And then our next one-on-one, -on -one, let's pick this conversation back up. And that was the coaching conversation. <laughs> it was just that. Because what did I just do there? I, I'm getting them to take ownership for their development. So even though it's my responsibility, I want to also make it their responsibility. This has to be a shared thing. Um, now there might be some things I need to, to, that they need to work on as well, but I'm always going to start with them. Where do you want to grow? Where do you want to change? And how I fill out this graphic is I say that, you know, in order for you, um, in order for you to get here, this is a different person. Hey, so we have to start being that different good. person now. And as you're this different uh -huh. person now, you'll find oh, okay. that yeah, these goals come to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think they muted before. Do you need to open hood at all? Yes, please. Perfect. Okay. Let me show you. Everyone's going to have their own style, right? The importance is that you have the conversation. Let me show you. Um, let me show you two real examples. Let me show you two real examples. I'm going to show you one, a staff member, and the other one is uh, an executive out, so outside my me that I'm coaching. And um, you can see it kind of similar, right? So you just whatever you you can you want to take from this, but I'll just walk you through this. So this one um, VP, 
I had that same talk. This, these are both of these are first conversations. So that's why I'm sharing it, right? These are both first conversations. So I did that little spiel, just like I explained to you. Uh, but also because we have an assessment we use with executives that helps them. They list everything they're doing and then they categorize it by gives me energy or takes energy away. And um, so what this person found was literally three quarters of their job takes energy away. Now it's partly because they're short staffed and they're, they're a super amazing person. So sweet, such a sweet person, but really like, man, this is really challenging right now. And so People will talk about their challenges, and then what I want them to do is I, I ask them to put them in the form of a question. I don't know if you can see that up here. And I'll say, like, how can we put these into the form of a question? How do I transition back into a more executive level work, right? I'm, I'm in the weeds right now. Okay, how do I get out of that? How do I optimize my schedule without causing harm in other areas, right? Like, how do I say no to things without causing fires? How do I structure my role so that it gives me more energy than it takes. And so initially it takes some prompting, but then people start coming up with, these are all the things I want to improve or get better at. And I get them to put them in a question form. And then I just say, which one would you like to start with? Right now, this is a coaching client, so it's not my employee. So I'm not going to tell them, okay, you got to start with this one. But I'm like, which one do you want to start with? Because honestly, any one of them if they pick, they're going to grow and it's going to, it's going to be great. And so that's what we do. And the, our first session is really just that. It's them clarifying one question that they are going to pick. And I think they chose this one here. It says, um, how, uh, how do I grow my team so we are more intentional and not reactionary? And uh, this would be the result if we did that. And so at the end of the... The end was um, the to do's was uh, they said, I, I'm going to schedule a lunch with a coworker to talk over these challenges and I'm going to, I'm going to get better at implementing an end of day ritual, something for my program. All right. So that's that. So let me show you an employee now. So um, actually I've, I've talked about her already that uh, she wants to uh, launch a clothing brand, right? That's one of her big ambitions. So I had the same kind of conversation. Where do you want to grow? And at first it's like, well, I want to become more consistent. I want to be more confident. I want to be better at time management. And people throw out these broad things. You have to dig deeper. Like, well, but what does that mean? What do you mean more confident? Like, where do you see a lack of confidence? Right? And so they talked about all these things. Here's some of my goals. I want to learn how to use, use AI, start uh, selling on my website to do a photo shoot, uh, improve my English, increase my income, increase my income sources. Right? And so we boiled this down to uh, basically two questions. How can I manage my time so I can get my work done, prioritize my family, and take care of myself? Second question, how can I show up every day confident in myself and in my ideas? And then I said, let's take that second question. What are some resources that can help you? I'm not sure. Why don't you take some time and think about that? And in our next one-on-one, -on -one, we'll pick this up there. And so that's why we wrote in green, brainstorm a list of resources that could help me. So again, what I'm doing there, I'm getting my employees to think or people I'm coaching to think. It takes the pressure off me. I don't have to have all the answers. I just need to be the catalyst. I need to shine the light. And of course, so let's say uh, for that employee, two weeks from now, they're going to have some resources. I might have to send them an, a, a, a note before our one-on-one. -on -one. Hey, by the way, we are going to talk about resources just to remind them. But we're going to have this conversation. And, um, you know, maybe they've come up with some. Maybe it's a book they're going to read. I'm like, oh, yeah, I've read that book. That's a fantastic book. Why don't you read it? What I did was I got it going. And now I can just manage the process. I can weigh back in. Hey, so tell me what you're learning. So the coaching doesn't have to be so, um, in other words, you don't have to go become a certified coach to figure this out. We just have to narrow in on a target and then, hey, let's chat about this. And so that's why I say in development stuff, uh, lean towards that approach. Somebody wants to be more confident. They need to, um, 
okay, let's take a, a pricklier thing. They need to become better at managing relationships because they cause problems on the team, right? So if they don't see that themselves, which they probably don't, uh, then I'm going to have to find a way to bring that up. Now, this, this is this is a longer conversation, more for like a coaching workshop, but uh, so I don't want to get too far off track. But that's the idea that when we get clarity, that's where it starts, right? Growth begins with clarity. And that's why if I can get them to ask one question. So let's go back to, you know, Tori, you said you want to get them uh, taking more ownership. And so that could, if they don't know that they don't take ownership, then that's the first conversation, right? They have to see it before they'll ever buy into it. People have to see that there's a problem and what it's costing them, not just the organization. Like, hey, when when you're not taking ownership, here's what happens, right? This is how this impacts you. This is how this impacts others. Uh, Kim, collaboration with other teammates. Again, that's another one of those things that sometimes people think there's no problem. I'm not the problem. Everyone else is the problem, right? So sometimes we got to at least get people open. Hey, do you think would you say that you're perfect then? Well, no, of course I'm not perfect. Okay, great. So if you could grow in an area in your relationships, what would it be? So to me, I prefer like that way in versus the hammer because then you're going to get resistance. And with coaching, with development, you really you really want them bought in so that they are they're pushing it ahead. That's how that's going to happen. Time management. So Deborah, time management Okay, how are you going to do that? What do you think are some good resources for you? Because, hey, I know time management for me, but I'm more artistic, you know, visual person, and I can't follow like an Excel spreadsheet, but you're a little bit different. So what do you think is going to be the best for you? What are some good resources? Okay, why don't you go think about that, and then let's talk in our next one-on-one. -on -one. Listening. They're probably not going to say that that's their thing. So that might be your thing. You might be say, hey, if I can throw one on the list, uh, I think if there's an area you could grow to become more effective at your job, it's to actually become a better listener. And here's why I say that, A, B, C, D, because I've seen this, 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 and this. And uh, do you see that? Right? You got to get them to see it. This is honestly the key to coaching is if they can't see the problem, you're wasting your time. You really are. If they can't see that there's a problem, if they can't see that there's a problem with their listening, they're not going to change long-term. Uh, Riley says, solution-focused rather than problem-focused. Okay, excellent, right? That's a mindset shift. So again, they're probably not going to see that. That's going to have to be something you pointing out. Like, hey, if I can offer something, I think if you really want to grow in your career. It's this subtle shift in being more solution focused than problem so focused. Here's why I say that. Because of this situation, this situation, and this situation. Do you see that? And he might be or she might be, yeah, I know sometimes I I just I can get focused on the problem. Okay. But do you see how that can actually be a problem? Yeah, I can see how that can be a problem. Well, how is that a problem? But like how do you think that impacts you negatively? Oh, it's because, yeah, then I'm I'm not focused on the solution. I get mired in this pit. Okay. But if you were more solution focused, what do you think that would do for you? Oh, I'd probably be this and this and this. All right. So let's work on this. Awesome. What do you think is going to help you do this? Right. That's, that's how I'm doing it uh, with all these things. I'm looking for like a really tough one. Now that some of these are tough, not cut corners on process. All right. So, you know, Rebecca, that might be more of a, of an expectation thing. Like, Hey, you just can't cut corners and you just got to keep, you know, um, dealing with it, dealing with it, dealing with it. And then if it's not changing, then yeah, you, you coach down into that. Hey, so what, tell me what's going on here. Cause I've talked to you three times about this and it hasn't changed. You still cut, you still cut corners. I need to understand why. Cause remember this, Nobody does anything irrationally, <laughs> even though people do irrational things. I do irrational things, but it's rational to me. That's why when something's not changing, you got to find out why. Like they're, they're thinking in a certain way. What is that? 
right? So I don't need to, again, I'm not trying to be their therapist. I don't need to be their counselor. Uh, I'm trying to create change. Courtney, clear communication, right? So again, what's that mean? They've got to know what that means. You've got to be able to give examples and then they've got to work on it. And we're going to praise progress. Um, and then lots of you talking about time management here. I, oh, nope, that's not it. That okay. is. Okay, that's the idea. Yes, we are. Thank you. Right? Getting them. Oh, I'm, I got it. I'm good. Thank you, Doug. Yep, thank you. Getting them to come up with a list. And of course, you're going to have a list. And like I said, the, the greatest thing you can do is just have a learning culture. And that's where you're sharing. Listen, here's the lessons I'm learning. Hey, here's what my boss said to me. Here's what my boss wants me to work on. Here's the mistake I made. Hey, when I was your age or when I was in your role, these are the mistakes I made. This is what I've learned about them. Um, here's what I'm really trying to change right now. Here's what I'm pushing into. Hey, if you guys have any ideas, let me know. Like when you're communicating like that, like when you're leading the way, it's easier for you to call people to, like, let's say you get somebody who's resistant. You can have that conversation. Like, hey, Larry, like, if I can be honest, it seems like you're resistant when I, I'm just trying to help you grow here. Uh, can we chat about that? Because that's the new problem. We have to deal with that problem before we can deal with the other problem. And you're always able to come back to, look, am, am I not always telling you guys what I'm trying to grow in? Like none of us are perfect here. I just, I'm, I'm here to help you, but this is an issue. So how, how can I help you? Like where, tell me where the resistance is. Like those are just honest conversations that you can have with people. Okay. So let's get back to, again, I'm kind of deep diving into coaching here, but so you see, this is a little bit like the coaching setup. If you haven't done this and I gave you two examples and in a sense, that would be the first coaching time. Well, these check-ins, this happens in my one-on-ones. It can happen outside the one-on-one -on -one as well. Like, let's say we're working on somebody with confidence and we just had a meeting and, you know, um, Sarah decides she just puts her hand up and, and says something that's a bit controversial and all the senior executives are in the room and it was pretty bold. And I know she's working on her confidence. Of course, I'm going to pull her aside after and go, that was amazing. It was amazing what you did. Like, tell me why you did that. What, what changed in your thinking, right? So I might do a little bit of coaching right there on the spot, but the bigger coaching is going to happen in the one-on-one. -on -one. Okay. Does that make sense, everybody? Also, let me tell you a secret about coaching. It's the obstacles that provide a window. Uh, obstacles provide a window, right? So if we take a learning arc, skills, knowledge, it's, it's just about learning some skills, practicing, iterating it. Like right now, you guys are learning some things. Okay, I can do this in my one-on-one. -on -one. Great. You're going to practice this. You're going to iterate it. You're going to make it your own. And that's going to lead to growth. But the more transformational things, like becoming more confident, people are going to, they're just going to keep hitting these bumps, hitting these obstacles. And that's good when they do, because then, awesome, this gives us a chance to talk. So welcome obstacles in the process of development. Alrighty. We have 12 minutes left and I have this last section to cover, but what's your, what's your, what's your takeaway from this piece on coaching, the learning and development piece? What's biggest takeaway for you here? And do you see how this would, you see how this would be a game changer with your relationship with your staff? being able to get into these kind of consistent conversations that are clear. Let them lead, don't lead them much more clarity on coaching, getting the employee to lead the way, getting people to self-reflect. Exactly. And getting people to self-assess is great. Hey, I got to grow my confidence. Okay. Where would you rate yourself on a scale of one to 10, 10 being I'm so confident. Where would you rate yourself? Oh, a six. Okay. What do you think, what do you think an eight looks like? And you get them to think. The callous like the pick and figure out how to get there. You're putting it back on them. Yeah, you got to put it back on them for sure. Okay, last one. I want to make sure you're in the loop. This is pretty straightforward. 
Remember at the very beginning, we had agenda, like what are your agenda items? And any that haven't been already dealt with, because a bunch of the agenda would have already been dealt with, like, oh, I got a problem here and I'm having an obstacle here. And so most of them check, check, check by the time you get here. But there's going to be some like, hey, my vacation last week of June, is that going to work? Uh, and I had a question about my uh, benefits. Who do I ask about that? Right. And so you just quickly deal with those. Yeah, perfect. That June works great. Benefits. You got to talk to HR because I'm not sure about that. Uh, here's here's who you need to talk to. And so you just deal with those. Anything else that you have not talked about, um, you are you're going to make sure that you cover in the agenda. Important news is a chance for you to just double check that they are in the loop because you are at meetings that they're not in. Now, they may not be privy to everything that you've heard, but they're probably privy to a bunch but it doesn't get passed down. And so this is just a chance to say, hey, just so you know, uh, as you know, uh, the CFO left. And so uh, right now they're they're interviewing candidates and I think they're down to two and they probably should have that position finalized in the next week. I know this has nothing to do with our department, but just I want to keep you in the loop. Uh, also, we're thinking of this merger and acquisition. Uh, it's, it's common knowledge, but you may not know about it. I want you to know, or it might be... Um, Hey, our team, we're thinking of bringing in an executive coach, you know, to work with our team. Uh, ultimately, I got to think more about it, but I just want you to know this is what I'm thinking. All right, so we're going to pull people in. Again, these are, this is one minute stuff. And uh, we're going to, we're going to end with next steps. Now, before I say that, next steps is going to be, let's, when are we meeting again? I encourage you to have one-on-ones every other week, if you can. Because if you do it once a month, it's just, you just lose a lot. And you take that connection and concern piece. It seems weird to be concerned once a month. I know every two weeks you could make the same argument, but, um, you know, are there times when a manager shouldn't share s some things with the staff? Uh, yes, if you're not supposed to, like senior management has told you not to. Or secondly, if they don't have all the picture that you do. Maybe you can't share the entire picture and only part of it, but that part of it in a sense would paint a, not a great picture for them. Like you have to consider how this would impact them. But for me, I lean on the side of transparency with, with our group. Um, everyone has their own culture, but I lean on the side of transparency. And so even if we have a bad month, I'll just tell people, Hey, we just had a bad month. Here's our revenue. Just so you know. And, Oh, we had a great month. This is just so you know. So that's how I treat our crew, and um, but you're going to have to to make those decisions. So I'm sorry I can't give you more detailed instruction there. One thing that I want to say, though, remember we talked about this being a positive thing. You want to think of places to recognize, reward, and recognize. So think about this. After the wins, let's say... Um, I'm going to get a little, uh, no, it's a triangle this time. Right here, I could potentially recognize something. They just shared a win. That's amazing. I'm not surprised by that because you're just such a tenacious person. That's why we love having you on the team. Hey, great work with that. Recognize them. They get here, performance and obstacles. If they've done really great, awesome. I'm going to recognize that. If they haven't and they're below the line, and maybe I have to have a conversation with them, I'm still going to try to end with, but you know what? I have no worries about you because you're this, you're this, you're this. I know your work ethic and your creativity combined. You're going to figure this out. So I totally believe in you. That's deposits in the account. Learning and development. Have they made progress? Let them know. Hey, I just want you to know, sometimes we don't see our own growth, but I have seen you grow in your confidence. And... Um, that's not easy. And I just want to tell you, like, this is because of your hard work. This is one of the reasons we we love having you here. And a man, keep it up. Right? Positive. And I could end with something positive. Hey, just as we wrap up, thanks for the time today. It was so great to meet with you. I love what you're doing on the project. I love how you're hitting your numbers and the numbers you're not hitting, that you're really focused on figuring it out. I also love how you're you're really committed to changing in becoming more confident. Um, it's amazing. So, hey, keep it up, right? So there's, you can always end 
on I mean, always there's going to be the odd time where maybe it's a little bit rough but that's what you want to do right make this a positive thing and so there's you can you can deposit in the account here you can account deposit here deposit here and deposit here and that's how it works so how long should these take you can do a one-on-one -on -one in 30 minutes you know that's that's pushing it and that's like hey they're doing pretty well and they're also doing pretty well with the performance stuff and so those are those are wrapped up in 10 minutes and now we're going to talk about the coaching and so we might spend 10 minutes there and then we're going to close out so sometimes i'll do a one-on-one -on -one that's 30 minutes but i always plan for more so i'll plan for honestly i put an hour in my schedule with the idea that we're going to go 45 minutes then if we go a little bit longer i'm not stressed about it and if we don't go longer, great. I have some margin in my schedule. Um, what if you lead a lot of people? Like what if you have a lot of direct reports? A lot to me is like eight or more. Um, so there are definitely some things you can do. And one is to switch to two, on, two to ones. Now, I know I said before, like you wouldn't group all your kids together and celebrate the same birthday. Uh, but two to ones is a little bit different because you create a, a triad, right? With you and the two others. And these actually can be really powerful because what happens is you meet with two at the same time, try to group them by similar experience levels, follow the same framework, and each person is going to benefit from the lessons that the other one learns. And when you're coaching one of them, so let's say you got Joey and uh, and Larry in the same group, and Joey ends up being the one you you spend all the time coaching on, then you can just turn to Larry, Larry, what did you get out of that? Or Larry, do you have anything to add? Like Larry's in the conversation and he's also growing at the same time. So, uh, you know, having having group having coached groups before, um, don't think that just because I gave attention to this one person that this other person suddenly feels left out. They don't. Okay. Okay. Wrapping up. One on ones. Make them a priority. They should end positive, even if you have to deal with difficult things. Precede some questions on the invite if you want, like some of those stay interview questions you can hey here's one question i want to talk about in the in the uh one-on-one -on -one tomorrow um help uh these the one-on-ones they help an employee move to the right on the motivation scale that's how it's done um i'm going to send you a link within the next 24 hours it'll have the replay it'll have the this templates there's a template in here of how to do the one-on-one -on -one. change it for what fits you and uh, I will send you also access to that OKR and KPI tool. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, Deborah. Hey, I want to say thank you for coming. I know it's tough to sit in a two and a half hour Zoom session. I hope that this, you got stuff out of this. I hope this served you. I know we didn't have a lot of time for questions, but I will stay on after. So I'll, I'll dismiss us and then I'll hang out here for a while if you've got some questions or a situation that you would like to talk through. Uh, what I would love to hear just before you're leaving, uh, maybe what's the big takeaway for you as you go out of here or how this training helped you, uh, that would really encourage me. I know we covered a lot. Again, keep, don't overcomplicate this. Even though I, I spent two and a half hours talking through a ton of stuff, don't overcomplicate it. I wanna make sure you're doing okay. I wanna make sure you're making progress and, and succeeding. I wanna make sure you're growing. And I want to make sure you're in the loop and then manage that time so that you accomplish those four things and anything else, plan it for another meeting. Like if someone's like, well, I just want to brainstorm about the new strategy. That's a different meeting. This is a, this is a one-on-one. -on -one. Okay. Takeaways, what helped you, um, leave a chat that will be helpful for me also if we're not connected on linkedin please uh let's connect there and uh if you if you like comment and share my posts it helps one of my staff members kpis <laughs> all right jillian you weren't driving i hope i don't think you were Uh, awesome, Jacqueline. Sounds like you're doing a fantastic job. Fantastic, Jillian. Good luck with that, Elizabeth. 
Right on. Awesome. Okay, guys. So on that note, hey, this is the end. But uh, if you've got some questions, maybe raise your hand because there's a lot of comments going through. So I, I've probably missed some questions. Um, but just raise your hand and we can go through that. I'll stick around here for a little bit. And you want to talk about coaching. You want to talk about performance management, OKRs, KPIs. You got a situation you're trying to coach somebody in. You're not sure the approach to take. Uh, however I can help out. The uh, OKR and KPI, let me, let me find that. I'll show you that for those who are here. I'll show you what that looks like. Mm, I got to share it. Okay, here it is. So <clears throat> this is the... Uh, OKR KPI tracker. And uh, what you'll do is you, you can change all these titles uh, and whatever they are. You can open these up. Of course, this is on Google Sheets, not, not Excel, but you can create the same one. So how we use it is we have people come in and write. They have to manually put this in. I know we could automate it, but we don't want that. We want people to have to go look up their stuff and put it in and we're either at, it's a total. So like revenue is gonna be a total or if we switch this to average, it'll just average whatever the numbers are there. Uh, monthly target, you know, what is our monthly target? What's the status? So green is um, we're good or uh, light green means, uh, means all is okay. Even though it doesn't look okay, all is okay because we know something you don't know kind of thing. Yellow, we're a little bit behind. And uh, light red, we're concerned, right? We're concerned, but um, still have a plan. And red, we're in trouble. So what I can do is I can just come in and uh, I don't have to pay attention to necessarily all the, the numbers. I can just come over here and see what people are thinking. And... Anything yellow or below, I'm going to look for a note. I want to know what's going on. And that tells me a lot before I go into a team meeting, right? So we might discuss this in a team meeting. The OKRs is going to be here. So here's where you would enter the objective. So let's say the objective, uh, again, it's going to be aspirational. So uh, I might say launch an award-winning podcast, right? That's the OKR. That's the objective for the quarter. Key result, all right, these are the steps. How are, are we going to get there? I'm going to create the steps, and those become the target, what we focus on. Same thing, we can just talk about, you know, each week with each task. I can come in here and update it. Now we're 50%. Who's the owner? Uh, what's the team? Notes, any obstacles? So I can go to the team OKRs uh, that they've set, and I can see how they're doing. This saves a lot of digging and fact-finding. And then each quarter, we change this. So what we do is at the end of the quarter, we have a retrospective. And uh, I'm doing a workshop probably in a month or so on how to do quarterly retrospectives. If you want, sign up for that. and teaches you the process. So it's a very powerful process, but you, you take your team back through the month and you look at um, what went well, what do we wish we had done more of? What are we going to do more of in the future? There's a lot of ways to run the, the retrospective. But <clears throat> part of the retrospective is now us creating new OKRs. So what we'll do, you'll come down here. And if you're using Google Sheets, you'll just duplicate this sheet. right? So if I duplicate this sheet right now, it's going to show here. I can change the name to OKR. I'm going to rename this. Uh, OKR, it'll be, uh, you know, quarter two, kind of like that. So anyways, I'm going to delete this now because this is what you guys will see when you come in. And I'll just keep duplicating. But the KPIs are going to pretty much stay. Um, well, I'm still going to duplicate the KPI sheet as well because I'm going to create a, a an April and a May. So, yeah, it's a little bit of a little bit of extra work setting this up. There's a lot of softwares out there that do this. 
Uh, you can go pay monthly for some are super complex, some are super simple. Basically, just what works for you. That's what you got to figure out. What works for you and your team. All right, is that helpful? Should be a video on this. Uh, if you open this up, it tells you, it gives you, um, yeah, I should have explained that. If you click on this plus, kind of tells you, here's how to do the OKRs. And uh, watch video for some reason that's not connected. Okay, let me just check for questions. <laughs> right on, Morgan. Fantastic. Bill, how do you how to motivate that your directs have one-on-ones with their directs? Um, <clears throat> different ways certainly to do that. The most obvious, make sure you're having them and uh, that you're running them really well. And then what you can do is you can ask them. So again, my approach is always, if I can first get you to do it on your own, that's the best thing, right? So I'm going to do a couple of, okay, uh, I'm going to do a couple of uh, one-to-ones and I'm going to make them awesome. And then I'm going to say, Hey, do you think these help you? Do you find these helpful? Oh yeah, this is such a helpful time. Okay. So do you think your people would be helped if you did these with them? Yeah, yeah, I know. I got to do them. Okay. Then let's talk about, let's talk about this, right? Because for sure they need this. So that's kind of like, I'm just telling you my style. That's my first way in. Um, but that doesn't always work because some people are like, well, I'm just super busy. But if, if I need to, uh, if I need that to happen, I'm just going to tell them, hey, I know this is difficult for you. I know it's a time crunch. You might have to adjust this, but I want you to have one-on-ones with your staff because there's four things I want you to make sure that they all have, that you know that they're doing well, that they're making progress, that they're growing, and that they are uh, in the loop. Now they might say, but they are in the loop and they are growing and I have these conversations and, uh, um, you know, then you got a little bit of a, a fight on your hand. So again, like I said earlier, nothing changes until they get on board. Even if you make them change, they'll do it. But it's not mean they do it well, because now we're at neighbor number one, right? Do this or else. So you can get compliance, but it doesn't mean you'll get excellence. But it depends what level you're at too, right? Bill, so you can, at the end of the day, if I want this, you got to do it. I'm hoping I don't have to make you do it. Um, and I'm, I, I want to find out what's the resistance. Like, so help me understand why you resist this, why you're not doing this. I just don't have time. So if you're saying if you had time, you would do these? Oh, yeah, 100%. Okay, so let's solve this problem. I need you to find time. I wonder, would you ever consider the, the two-on-one as an opportunity where <clears throat> suppose you have a situation, you have a direct, it's like, I, I don't know how to do this. I'm a little bit uncomfortable where you use a two on one as almost a modeling session or something like that. It crosses my mind that might be useful. It might also be weird if you have the boss with you, you know, where it's like two direct levels. So I'm not sure, but. You could do that for sure. So do you mean a two on one, like the two coworkers and you, or are you talking a different level? I was wondering, so let's say I've got a direct and they're okay, maybe I could do this. I'm not really sure how, I'm not confident. I wonder if the two-on-one might be a mechanism to say, well, how about I'm there with you sort of walking through it. We did a similar thing, you know, where, I don't know, an example was we were having conversations around uh, whatever it was. And it was like, well, I'm not quite sure how to deliver this. Well, let's do a couple of them together and, and I can model for you. And then we can go from there. For sure. If you have a culture that's set up as a growth culture, then that wouldn't seem weird. Okay. What you don't want is that other direct report or your directs direct to feel like, oh my goodness, why is my boss's boss here? Like, <laughs> right. Not a bit. Yeah, uh, the other thing right. is if your boss has good one-on-ones with you, you can ask your boss, hey, can I bring my employee to this because I want him to see you do a one-on-one because I want him to do this. So that would be another way um, okay. to do it. Uh, but again, if the best way if you're doing it with them and then just being like, I want you to do this. And, um, you know, when I do this workshop next time, send them and say, you got to go to this workshop. 
and but you got to practice this. None of this is smooth until it is. Sure. Right? I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Hope that helps.